Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. I caught Karen, my dad's girlfriend, snooping through his bank account on his computer, so I exposed her as a gold digger. I'm 16, female. My dad, who's 36, male, has been dating Delia, who's 42, female, for a year. He introduced us three months ago, and to keep it short, I don't like her. When my dad's not around, she's super passive-aggressive, and I feel like she's constantly trying to compete with me and be like his favorite or the better one. I honestly don't know how to explain it. I can't really discuss it with someone because it's not like I have any proof or anything. Yesterday, she came here at 8 a.m. because the three of us were supposed to spend the day together, but my dad got called in for an emergency and said he'll be back by 2 p.m. No problem. I sat at the kitchen where you have full view of the living room, not because I was watching her, but because I've always sat there to do homework. If I looked at her, all I could see was her back, so I thought she was on her phone. I had to go to my room to get some papers, and when I walked behind her to go to the stairs, I saw what she was doing. She was using my dad's laptop. He's an architect, so his laptop is really, really important, and he doesn't let anyone use it. I thought to myself, what? But couples are weird, and guessed that she was the exception. She's also in the field. She saw me, smiled, and I went upstairs, got my thing and came back down. I guess she thought I was going to my room for a while, because when I walked behind her again, she didn't notice me. She was seeing my dad's bank account, his Facebook, and his Instagram. She really had three things open at once, and I said, hey, you shouldn't be seeing that, and I took his laptop. She got red in the face and tried to make excuses like, I was trying to close them, it's not what you think, until she got mad and said that she was his partner, and I had no right to snatch things from her hands and that I was being a jealous brat because daddy wasn't all mine anymore. She demanded an apology and I told her to get out until my dad came back because I wasn't comfortable having her around anymore. She did leave but called my dad crying and made a fake version of what happened. He came back mad but after I explained what had happened and he saw the living room footage, he knew I was telling the truth, apologized and thanked me. My grandmother on the other hand is upset because she really loves Delia and said that I did act like a jealous daughter and that when you have a man, you have to make sure he's good and agreed that I should apologize because I acted like a huge jerk. You're not the jerk and it's amazing your dad has your back. Let your other family members be mad. You did the right thing for your father. Simple. Not the jerk. Delia was crossing a boundary of your dad's, his rule that no one should touch his laptop and on top of that, she was clearly invading his privacy by going into his online accounts. You defended his boundary because you knew she was crossing it and her behavior wasn't okay. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Delia? Please let us know. Dad sides with his daughter over his girlfriend? Now that's a pleasant surprise. Husband wrongly accused me of stealing from him, so I returned the shoes that I bought for him. I'm 29 and my husband, who's 36, is the breadwinner of the family. I stay home with the kids who are preschool age. He pays for the mortgage, bills, household needs, food, kids needs, etc. He has set a monthly budget for each category and handles getting everything done. Recently, he's become overwhelmed and told me to handle grocery shopping, but before he let me, he asked me to write a list of all the stuff we need so he could calculate the total and also so he'd have an idea how much I'll be spending when I take his credit card. I didn't have an issue with that because this way we'd watch our spending habits. However, he said I'm never allowed to get something that isn't on the list unless I'm paying for it some other way. On Friday, I was doing some grocery shopping as usual and saw that the store had some nice shoes on sale. The price was insanely low for this brand and so I decided to grab a pair for my husband thinking that he'd be happy with them since he needed new sneakers anyway. I bought them and when I showed them to him, he flipped out on me saying I made a huge mistake by buying something that wasn't on the list. I agreed with him but I thought that since the shoes were for him, then it would be different. He said I messed up and shouldn't have bought those sneakers without even telling him. But in my defense, I said that the price was low, so it's not like I spent $100 on shoes. And also, I saw this as a great deal and wanted him to have those nice sneakers. He plainly said that what I did is considered stealing since he never consented to have those sneakers purchased and said that I'm being irresponsible with money. 
That is why I no longer have an income and my spending habits need a grip. I felt hurt by what he said. We argued about it for hours and he avoided speaking to me for the rest of the day. The next day, I went and returned the sneakers and took the money back. He got home in the evening and lost it when he found out I returned them. He said he couldn't believe how petty and childish I was to actually do this. I explained I was just correcting my mistake. He tried to contact the store and was told the sneakers were already sold. He even got angry with me, but I told him that he accused me of stealing from him when I was just trying to do a nice gesture for him. He yelled that I had a lot of nerve calling what I did a nice gesture while using his money to do it. I told him he had no right to yell at me after I corrected my mistake and gave back the money he accused me of stealing. He threw a fit, then went out with his friends and came home late at night still not talking to me. Did I mess up? Maybe I shouldn't have purchased them knowing they weren't on the list, but I just wanted him to have those sneakers and thought I was doing a nice gesture. Not the jerk. His money? Charge him for cooking, cleaning, laundry, general housekeeping, and childcare then. If you're a stay-at-home mom, he earns family income. This is not right. As for the argument that you stole his money to buy him a gift, it's beyond messed up. If you decide to stay with him, surely you should stop buying him birthday and Christmas presents. By his own logic, you are stealing from him. My mom took some time off work when my sister and I were very little and my dad worked. I was talking to him about it the other day and he said, I may have been earning the money, but there's no way I could have dedicated that much time to my job if your mom hadn't been doing so much at home. She earned it just as much as I did. We're a team. You're supposed to be working together, OP. Ask yourself how often your husband acts like you're on opposite sides. Not the jerk. Not the jerk, but I'm seriously concerned for you. Almost all couples in your same situation with only one breadwinner share finances, so you should have your own credit card and be able to make reasonable purchases without discussion. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Yowza good nowza. I'm concerned for her too, to be honest. Am I the jerk for refusing to work from home so now people can no longer bring their dogs to the office? Hi, I'm 32, female. Here it goes. When everyone was working in the office, dogs were never even an option. Lockdown, shutdown, working from home. People trickled back in and they're allowed to bring their dogs to ease the transition. My group stays back for another year. Everyone's finally called back to the office. I'm allergic to dogs and the smell gives me migraines. Huge bummer because I do like dogs, but it explains why in one foster home I was always feeling sick. Boss says we'll figure something out. People with their own offices are not willing to give them up. Boss tells me that maybe it's best if I work from home. I live in a tiny studio that barely fits my bed and I have to sit on it or on my floor to have a workspace. I have one window, it's suffocating and I was starting to go crazy living there during lockdown and working from home. So I say that if I can negotiate a raise that will be enough to help me move to a larger place, I will consider working from home. Boss takes that to their boss, comes back and says unfortunately it's not in the budget. I say I'm not going back to working from home. Boss insists it couldn't be as bad as I'm saying and that everyone has to make adjustments. Mind you, boss and most of my other coworkers live in houses that they own. Most have huge backyards, entire rooms to dedicate as an office, etc. So of course they don't think it's a big deal. I stand firm and remind them that someone can give me an office, but no one would. So unfortunately, everyone has to stop bringing the dogs to the office. Coworkers and other people in the building are saying I'm being selfish for not just taking the deal and going back to working from home because they had all love to be allowed to. When I've told people about the tiny apartment and how I can't afford more, they say things like, just move back in with your parents, or stop buying Starbucks, and start doing Uber and Uber Eats after work, and move to the suburbs, as if I'm choosing to be in this position just to spite them. Others have been like, why can't you just take a Claritin and tell me I'm making up the smell causing migraines? Each of them has a suggestion about how I should just go out of my way to make all these changes, some of which I can't even do, just because people want to bring their dogs to the office. Am I really the jerk for this? Thanks for the responses so far. I appreciate the judgments and they're giving me a lot to think about. Just as a note, due to circumstances I would prefer to not get into too much, I cannot just go find a new job or a new place to live. These are things that are, for me, out of my control for the time being. Things will hopefully change in a few years. Not the jerk, but I'd start looking for a better job. People are jerks in an office and they won't get over this. Your environment there is only going to get worse. Not the jerk. If they want to be with their dogs so much, one of them should make the sacrifice of giving up their office 
or they should be given the option to work from home. Not the jerk. Dogs weren't permitted before lockdown. They shouldn't be permitted now. Yeah, it sucks leaving the fur babies at home, but it is what it is. I may be out of line with my thinking, but this could technically be considered discrimination because of a known medical condition. Maybe the threat of an EEOC complaint would straighten out your boss. 1000% not the jerk. This is your health. I love dogs too, but I would not bring mine to a place that would cause someone else discomfort. I occasionally bring my dogs to work. However, I always let coworkers know that they are coming and I ask if it's okay. When we hire new staff, I ask them how they feel about dogs in the workplace. If it made one single person uncomfortable, I would not bring the dogs. Fortunately, we are all dog obsessed, so it's all good. It's not as easy as take a Claritin. I hate when people say that. I have a severe food allergy. Can't even be in the same room with it. Coworkers are totally cool with just not bringing that food to work. Some will go out to their cars to eat it, then wash their hands when they come back in. That's how kind, caring human beings behave. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or coworkers? Please let us know. Employees fighting over not being able to bring their dogs to work? If I owned any shares in this company, I'd sell them right now. Leveraging my job description to put an end user in his place. I used to manage a Cadillac dealership's network a couple of years ago. There was a car salesman who also liked to study computers in his spare time. Unfortunately, that also meant that he knew way too much to be absolutely dangerous. I would constantly get complaints about him bunking down on his specific floating desk on the floor and locking it out from anyone to use it but him. I reached out to management about it, but they didn't want to do anything about it. Even though he was bypassing many security features like local admin, used a boot ENV to give himself local admin, web filtering, unapproved apps, remoting, etc. All via USB with a bunch of portable apps. Management. Why are you coming to us about an IT problem? This isn't a management problem when it involves computers. Isn't that your job? I'm pretty sure that's in your job description. You get the idea. But I was sick and tired of getting calls and messages daily about this one guy. So I decided that if management wasn't going to have my back on this issue, then I guess I have free reign to handle it how I please, right? Since I was dealing with an above average user, I decided to go to the furthest extreme. I took a machine, imaged it to the same image as the floating desk machines, and went to town planning all the restrictions needed. BIOS locked with password. Boot to USB disabled. Chasis locked and closed. Auto login to a generic sales account. USB disabled in Windows. Desktop redirected to a folder on the file server with locked permissions. No delete, specific icons only. Chrome browser only. No Internet Explorer or anything else. Chrome bookmarks set to only what is needed. Log off removed, only restart or shut down. Even if he did manage to somehow log off, it would just log back in to sales. Add a litany of other basic Windows restrictions that essentially silos the machine to either Chrome or their car sales software. I brought all my changes and my purchase requisition for the locks over to management and was approved with no questions. I sold it as a necessary security measure and threw my weight around about how this is in my job description to address it and implement it. Spent an early Monday morning rolling out all the changes before he came in. Late afternoon rolls around and he finally shows up. I'm off the clock, but decided to stay to see the fallout. He walks in, makes a beeline to his desk, and watched as he sat confused at everything. I can't log out. I can't boot my USB. Windows can't see my USB either. I can't do anything at all. I watched in pure satisfaction as he just got up from the chair and walked around the sales floor aimlessly with nothing to do. The bonus part is after all the changes, whenever a different salesperson complained about the changes, all I needed to say was, sorry for the inconvenience, the changes were necessary due to a salesperson messing with the computers. I'm not allowed to say who it was though, so unfortunately the changes will need to stay. They all knew who it was though. Am I the jerk for letting my ex sign over his paternity rights before he knew the babies were his? Me, female 42, and my boyfriend, male 57, of four years split recently. We met while we were both going through divorces and we got together about six months after mine was final. His was final before mine. We lived in different towns, so we sometimes would go a couple of weeks between visits due to distance, but it worked for us. He has four kids, a son who's 37, daughter who's 35, son who's 14, another son who's 12, and has shared custody of the two youngest with his second ex-wife. I share two kids, my son who's 18, my daughter who's 16 with my ex-husband. It just hasn't made any sense for us to move closer due to having to fight with exes to change custody agreements. 
I found out eight months ago that I was pregnant. This was completely unexpected as he had a vasectomy after his last son was born. Neither of us had any intention to have more kids and I was not prepared to be pregnant at 41. I didn't even find out until I was almost five months along. I went to see him and his reaction was, well, he broke things off with me and had some very choice words to call me. He refused to believe anything other than that I was seeing someone else and trying to pin this pregnancy on him. His ex-wife cheated on him often, which is why they split, so part of me understands his emotional reaction, but he spent the last eight months ghosting me and has refused to even speak to me. The babies, twins, a boy and a girl, were born three months ago. I do not need his financial help, but I decided to file for child support so he would do a paternity test. Once his friend said he took the test, but before we had the results, which I never needed, he was the only person I had been with, I had him served with papers to sign over his parental rights and all financial responsibility as well. Unsurprisingly, he signed the papers without hesitation. We got the paternity test results back and now he's blowing up my phone and showing up at my house angry at me and saying I'm the jerk because I refuse to entertain the idea of getting back together or moving closer to him. He also says I tricked him into signing over his rights. I am aware he may be able to fight me as it is recent. Some of my friends and family are telling me I am the jerk for doing this to him and others say they understand why I did. So, dear Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit. I live in Colorado. We did have to go to court to relinquish his rights, but it was a very short visit. He did not deny paternity. He admitted to never wanting anything to do with the babies, that he had not met them, and that the distance between us would make it difficult to co-parent. My lawyer brought up his felony that he had abandoned the babies, the fact that I have both financial means and family support. The judge agreed termination was acceptable. I will apologize because after speaking to a few people, I'm learning it is rarely this smooth when my lawyer made it sound and seem so easy. I do know he can fight and possibly get his rights back and I'm undecided on if I would fight him on that. I am absolutely willing to co-parent with the man. I am not willing to forget what happened and just start dating again. Not the jerk. Why would you get back together with someone who accused you of cheating? He has nobody to blame but himself. And if he signed over rights and the kids weren't his, the papers wouldn't have meant a darn thing. Sounds to me like his family is giving him crap and now he wants to save face. OP. I do believe he really felt there was zero chance of the babies being his. I was 100% fine with a paternity test when I found out I was pregnant because of course with the vasectomy he was going to have concerns and that I could have dealt with. But ghosting me was childish and left me alone when I was feeling very vulnerable. Now he wants to be a family. He is a good dad and I would be okay with him being in the twins' lives, but I don't want to pass off kids every other week for the next 18 years. Not the jerk. He didn't have a problem with accusing you of cheating. He didn't have a problem with leaving you alone the rest of your pregnancy. He didn't have a problem with giving up his parental rights. Now he should not have a problem with facing the consequences. He's saying that you tricked him into signing over his rights? Yeah, sure, right. Unless you presented a stack of mundane papers awaiting his signature and hid the paternity docs in the middle, he knowingly signed away his rights. There was no trickery. Your ex needs a wake-up call on reality and personal responsibility. Not the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her ex? Please let us know. Don't want to heed my warning about giving deep discounts to wealthy clients? I work for a company that does commissions for clients. I'm the manager of my department. This comes with a number of responsibilities. One of them is bidding on work. Last fall, I evaluated the current global situation and how it would be affecting the costs of our supplies and possible shortages as well as inflation. As a result, I priced a few of our pieces of work to help prepare us for the price increases I had predicted, giving us an 8-10% to profit upon completion. A well-known client came in and contracted us to do a rather large and time-intensive project. This individual is very well off and is in no way in any danger to be going broke anytime soon. However, this client complained about the new prices. He had contracted us in the past on certain items and wanted the same work done again, but seeing the new price, he complained to the boss and threatened to go somewhere else. The owner, my boss, decided I had priced the work too high based on the complaints of this one customer. Previous customers had not batted an eye. Boss asks me to adjust the price down to be the same as the competition. Just so you know, the competition does not carry the same quality standards and often has a two to three year turnaround. I explained this to the boss that my numbers were based on the increases from suppliers and subcontractors who I speak to regularly. These companies we work with warned me beforehand about what was coming and I took it all to heart. I had passed the warning on to the boss at the time 
but it appeared he blew it off or forgot about it, and at the time of making the new price list, he didn't complain. It wasn't until this one, somewhat well-known local client, Rose's stink, that he decided to bring the issue up with me. So Boss insisted that we should be pricing lower to keep up with the competition or we would lose this customer. Of course, I argued that it wouldn't hurt us in the long run, and all we would be doing is attracting tire kickers. He stood his ground though, and I didn't have the energy to fight him on it. So in the end, he's the boss and got what he wanted. So the time came to order the supplies and pay the subcontractors. The cost of these materials, as well as the work done on them, were 90% of the price Boss had agreed to for the customer. This is before my own labor costs were factored in. Boss sees the bill and gets really upset and asks me what the customer was paying to have the work done. I gently reminded him that this was for rich tire kicker customer and I had warned him well beforehand but because he wanted to retain rich tire kicker customer, he got what he wanted, but the company did the work at cost and perhaps more with my labor factored in. Boss later came to me and asked me to make up a new price list. I told him I didn't need to. I did that last fall, and as long as no one gives deep discounts, we will be in the green. He's listening to me now. I'm the chief inspector of a helicopter maintenance facility. We have a few high net worth individuals, billionaires, not multimillionaires, multi-billionaires, whose helicopters we perform annual inspections on. One of them has over-the-top documentation requirements, well above and beyond the FAA minimum requirements, which already aren't anything to scoff at, due to their management company's policies. For the last two years, I've been telling our sales and contracts folks to bid higher on that particular customer to help recover the cost of the man hours associated with all their additional documentation. Sales and contracts. Oh no, we can't do that we could lose the customer that way. For the last two annual inspections, our profit margin on this customer was negative once and almost made 1% once because we refused to charge the billionaire's flight department a little extra over an irrational fear of losing them as a customer. Karen Mother demands the password to see my grades. Little bit of backstory. The story revolves around me, 17 female, and my mom, 36 female, who I will call entitled mom. Entitled mom and my dad went their separate ways when I was very little, they weren't married, and I went to live with my grandparents on my dad's side. Entitled mom would sometimes spend a few days with us and then go who knows where. Around two years ago, she left and didn't come back. I see her maybe once a month. In my country, we have a website that shows your grades, exams, and stuff like that. You have your email and a password. I never gave Entitled Mom my password because she never asked for it and I didn't think that she'd even need to see my grades. No one except me has my password. So I was doing my homework and I got a call from Entitled Mom. That's rare, so I picked it up. This is approximately the conversation. Entitled Mom. Hey OP, how are you? Me. Good, how about you? A little bit tired, but fine. Me. Good to hear. Do you need anything? Entitled Mom. Well. I just wanted to know how you are and ask you to give me your password to your grades. Me. What? Why? I lost the password I had, so can you give it to me again? Me. What are you talking about? Why do you even have my password? Well, you typed it in on my phone once years ago and it stayed there. I changed my phone, so I need you to give it to me again. Me. No, you will not have my password. That's my personal information and I don't feel comfortable by you looking at my grades and exams. Oh, come on. It's just grades. And besides, I am your mom. I have the right to see your grades. It's not that big of a deal. Me. It is. You can't look at my grades. It's my personal information, and I don't want you anywhere near it. And besides, you aren't really a good mom to begin with. Oh, are we going there now? Well, you shouldn't complain that much. After all, I live the life you wanted to have. A life I wanted? Are you nuts? I can't believe you would say that to a minor. Do you hear yourself? Are you crazy? Why are you yelling? If it's about your grades, me, this is not about my grades. This is about my private information that you have no right to. You are a bad parent, and I'm so ashamed to be related to you. I'm going to change the password, and goodbye. I stopped the call then, and I changed the password right away. This type of conversation is not unusual for her, but she really made me mad. That's all. I just wanted to share my story. License email mailboxes for all former employees? I don't recommend it, but okay. Edit for clarity. 
Bad IT Director had a few nicknames, like IT Director, Dental Commander, IT Commando, Computer Commando, IT Joe, IT Boy, Hacker God, Hacker Dude, and IT Bob. These were all real nicknames we gave to the guy as we dealt with his antics. Sorry if confusing, but personally my favorite part of dealing with him. Everyone else as named. A few years ago at my previous job, I was a senior technician at a managed service provider of IT services. We were a small company and were often yes men to just about anybody who would offer us money in exchange to their requests. The owner of our company would not push back against those that made crazy demands, overly cheap or even overly disrespectful clients. This led us to oftentimes doing tasks out of our normal scope at cost and a lot of times being cussed at for no good reason. Our primary services included on-site service and support and cloud hosting of in-house and third-party solutions, one of which was Microsoft 365, which obviously is very commonly used for email services. We would keep living knowledge base pages on each company, their services, environment info, and even policies of which different companies may demand, like only follow through with support requests from office managers, or if admin access is needed for this particular cluster of servers, contact Jim. One of our clients was a dental company that was of decent size. They had about 10 locations and were growing. Customers loved them and we often took pleasure going on site as it was heaven dealing with such polite people in contrast to what we had to deal with most of the time otherwise. They would even demand us to have some lunch if we happened to be on site during their Friday luncheon. It was great. They used 365 services and only used E3 licensing for their users, which was total overkill. $20 per user per month when most employees barely even checked email, let alone made an Excel doc. They wouldn't take our recommendation to go use the essentials at $5 per user instead, unless it was an office manager or headquarters worker. Also, they had a decently high turnover rate as it was a college type town and a lot of students would work there in one of the various positions to make decent pay and good experience while attending school. They would come and go. The IT director, literally only a title anyone can wear nowadays, was pretty bad at his job. Of this company called us one day yelling because there were a bunch of mailboxes that were not licensed. We tried to explain that these were mailboxes that were converted to shared of employees that had left. Doing so allows us to remove the license of the mailbox while keeping all of the mail intact and very easily accessible if we needed to delegate access to someone who needs to review. You basically get to archive the mailbox for free. He barely let us even speak and the tech who actually took the call was flustered, so I took it over completely. Using my best, well-seasoned customer service charm, I tried to explain to him the same, yet to no avail. They had 180-ish unused mailboxes that he wanted us to convert to a user box and add one of those premium I'm drinking Stella in a fancy glass licenses at $20 a pop per month. He resorted to personally insulting me, telling me I'm a tech guy who got promoted too fast and I should try a four-year school next time and demanded it be done right away with no specifics on how it be done. Bless your heart, man. Okay, we'll do it. Luckily, we record the calls. Also, I'll make note, this company has a policy that we are not allowed to use PowerShells, which for those that don't know is a terminal that allows us to perform action by command line. We can write scripts for special tasks or even do things in bulk, saving lots of time. I knew this very well and I begged them repeatedly to let us use PowerShell in the past to no avail. So we ordered pizza in the office and got to work, converted every last mailbox to normal and licensed it. We even converted a spider into a god as he struck fear in us with his hairy legs and many ears. We weren't worthy. After we finished, we even had a contest to see who could frisbee off his 2003 discs the furthest since we had a binder full of them as well as a few other goofy games for about a half hour before we dipped out. It was a fun late night at work in the end. A month or so rolls by and our accountant had sent out all of the invoices to our customers on that fine second Monday of the month. Our dental commander called us at 12.03 p.m., three minutes after he would have gotten his, and he had blown a head gasket. He finally saw the bill for the additional 180 E3 licenses, plus taxes and fees. He was threatening to sue if me and my two coworkers or our boss didn't fix it. One thing about our pushover owner is that he didn't take kindly to someone insulting his workers directly as he took it personally since he interviewed everyone himself. He listened to the call recording after we begged him to do so. 
he did not like what he heard from IT Commando. He didn't give in, and he even added a little razzle-dazzle that we had never seen before. He even noted that because it was a written policy that we can't use PowerShell, we should have billed the request as a project since they demanded it be done in such a short time and was not a normal support request. In order for us to remove the licenses, they would also have to have this done at the same project rate and they would have to pay for the bill as well as the two projects now or we wouldn't touch it, period. Our project rate was $125 an hour for junior techs and $175 an hour for senior techs. It was going to be about two hours per head, all at the senior rate for each leg of the ordeal, so about 12 hours all in all as there were three of us. Computer Commander didn't know that the owner of his company and ours were moderately close friends for nearly two decades, would occasionally play golf together and whatever company owners do when not at the office. The dental company owner and IT Joe came to our office immediately. Before allowing the discussion to proceed far past hello, our company owner played both calls on full blast over one of those Logitech 2.1 systems. It was loud. Dental company owner was absolutely shocked at what was heard as this guy was always looked at in high standards. Hacker God was pale white as he sat there and did not move a muscle. He immediately told IT boy to call an Uber back to the headquarters and to stand by in the conference room. He wouldn't be driving back with him. He apologized profusely to us techs, nearly in tears it seemed. He wrote a check for one of the projects and the bill. We agreed to undo the work for free as he was a really good client of ours and was always nice. He gave us each $100 Visa gift cards the next week and bought us lunch in our own office a few times, all out of his own pocket. Hacker Dude was fired as soon as the owner of the company got back to the office and he entrusted us to take care of his IT systems while he found his replacement, who was ultimately better in every way. They took every recommendation of ours, including reducing the license types for the majority of their workers, while confused as to why this was ever a debated topic. This is the one company I truly miss at my last job. A good client. Neighbors demand my parking space so their kids can play in it. I, 27 female, am currently single. I purchased a nice big apartment in a quiet neighborhood a few years ago, and along with it, I also got three parking spaces, each for about $25,000. This is a lot of money, but at the time, I figured parking was crap, and it was about to get worse in terms of availability. That turned out to be true. I have two cars, and my ex used to have one, so we used all three spaces. Recently, we broke up, and I started traveling a lot. I let my baby cousin use one of the cars, so I had two free parking spots. I offered them to my only neighbor, which I like. She's engaged, but has no kids. I rented them both to her for $100, even though realistically, rent should be $700 to $800. I checked prices and they're going crazy. One space rents for $300 to $400. The rest of our neighbors were not a favorite choice of mine because honestly, they suck. One of my parking spaces is kind of small and I have a big BMW, which I parked in that spot one night. The next day, they had parked in such a way that I was unable to move without crashing into someone. When I asked them to move their cars and promised to just switch around parking spots so issues don't repeat, I got the answer. You are smart enough to leave your car there. You should be smart enough to get it out. Don't you have a million cars? Go drive somewhere else. I got them towed and they screamed at me, so that was fun. Suffice to say, we are not friends with the four families involved in this fiasco, which is why my lovely neighbor, Sky, that even defended me, got my parking spots. People noticed Sky's cars, and only a few days later, they made a building association meeting, something I haven't been invited to in a year, and sat me down and let me know that the parking situation is unfair. They said I have to put the parking spots up for the whole building and have a rent auction for who will pay the most. They said they feel I was being unfair as they had kids and Sky doesn't. I felt bad and talked it over with Sky. She agreed her and her fiance can manage with one of the bigger spaces, which barely fits two cars, the second block in the first. Well, they weren't happy. Apparently, they all wanted this big parking space because it is in the shade and they can put slides and other contraptions for their kids to play in. I let them know this makes me uncomfortable as I will be back at some point and I do not want anyone to invest in anything. They called me selfish and a jerk. I got upset and told one of the moms who was on my case that kids are a choice and that does not make her special. She kept saying, no wonder you are single, no wonder you don't have kids. She called me a rich spoiled brat.
No one except Skye speaks with me anymore. Should I just give them the parking spot they want? Am I the jerk? No way. You shouldn't even give them a chance to rent any of your spaces. They can't choose who you rent to. You own it, you get to decide. For all they know, you're not renting it. You just told your neighbor they could park there. Forget them. If they come at you with some BS, tell them to call your lawyer. OP, I'm trying to figure something out because at the end of the day, I gotta look at them every day and watch them sneer and scowl. I know parking spaces are mine and ultimately the decision is up to me. I may be second guessing the fairness of it all and how I acted. I have told them off and have refused to talk about it anymore. I guess I just want a more grown up solution. I don't even understand why they're fighting so hard for two spaces which I will most likely reclaim in a month when I get homesick. Not the jerk. Do not listen to them. Get a lawyer. Have all communications regarding the spaces referred to your lawyer. Get business cards from him to hand out. Don't listen to people who don't care about you. Also, get cameras for your residence and enjoy your life. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay for my stepson's tuition? Some quick background knowledge. My mom passed when I was 8 years old and upon her passing, my dad and I discovered she was much wealthier than we thought. She set up an education fund with enough money to put me through college and grad school and attend a private school. I attended a private school I had a partial scholarship to and then went to college on a full scholarship I worked insanely hard for. I went to grad school on no scholarship, so I dipped into a bit of the education money. However, after all of this, I still had quite a bit of money left over, so I planned to use it for any kids I had in the future. And now the present. My biological daughter, Anna, who's 17, female, has attended a private high school and recently got into a good college on a partial scholarship. She wants to go to medical school. Between the three of those, if she can get a partial scholarship to medical school, I would be able to help her out significantly, so she would be in very little debt. I realized how insanely privileged we are to have this opportunity, and both my daughter and I are super happy to have it. I have a stepson, Jake, who's 18, who is also going to college this fall. He didn't go to the same high school as Anna because he didn't get in, so he went to the local public high school. He's still an excellent athlete and student, and that landed him a partial scholarship at his top choice college. Obviously, I was super elated and super proud of both my kids. Here's where the issue comes in. My husband and I, who have been married for three years now, came up with a plan for parenting slash financing and all that stuff. We plan to keep most of the money separate when it comes to kids. Obviously, we'd both contribute to buying them presents and stuff, but we left cars, college, etc. up to the other one, and it's worked out pretty well. Both Anna and Jake have cars that they paid half for, and we matched whatever they saved. I matched for Anna, and my husband matched for Jake. So for college, it was obviously decided my husband had Jake's stuff under control, and I'd be dealing with Anna's. However, my husband finds it very unfair that Anna will be in no debt and Jake will be in debt, since I'm covering Anna's college costs, but not Jake's. My husband says it's unfair that Anna will have an easier life than Jake, and called both of us spoiled and entitled kids for not sharing the money. My mother-in-law also dropped by yesterday and told me I was being unfair and I should help Jake out, and that I clearly loved him less. I explained to both of them that this was the agreement my husband agreed to, and he only has a problem because Anna will end up doing better now. Mother-in-law and husband are both giving me and Anna the silent treatment. Am I the jerk? Edit. Jake's mother is out of the picture. She left years ago, and neither Jake nor my husband are in contact with her or know where she is, as far as I'm aware at least. Anna's father passed soon after she was born. Not the jerk. Each agreed to take care of your own kids. How is it suddenly unfair? Your hubby is the jerk, and if granny wants to join in, Tell her to crack open her purse and chip in since she's so insulted. OP, what a great suggestion. Definitely using that against my mother-in-law. You've only been married for three years. That money long predates him. You should ask him if he enjoyed growing up with a mother, then tell mother-in-law if she's so concerned about her kids' and grandkids' education, maybe she can go off and pass like your mother did. They need a reality check of how privileged they are and that this money didn't just manifest itself out of nowhere. You suffered a major loss and this is what's left. Your daughter will always be your daughter, but if things don't work out for you or your hubby, statistically speaking, Jake will no longer be your stepson and you will never see the money again and your daughter will be further in debt because of it. It might not sound like it, but I'm very sorry for the loss of your mother. Not the jerk. The two of you had an agreement which he had no problem with until now. 
What does Jake think about this situation? It sounds like your husband is just unhappy that his biological son isn't doing as well as your biological daughter. OP I think Jake wishes he had the money, but he's not blowing it out of proportion and is currently asking his grandmother and dad to drop it. He's being very nice to both Anna and I. It's his father who's dragging this out. Well, what do you think? Should OP pay for her stepson's college or not? Please let us know. Absolutely not, but I hope she considers leaving this guy. He sounds like a real trip. Don't want me to work during my notice? Okay, I won't. This happened almost five years ago. Some details are intentionally vague. I was working in an organization that was super toxic. So much so that we were a revolving door. Most employees stayed only a few months. To counter this, our management put three months notice into everyone's contract, including existing employees. It's not strictly illegal where this happened, but very unusual. I believe the idea was to make it harder for employees to find a job outside, as employers didn't usually want to wait for three months. However, this didn't work as people simply quit and waited for a month or two before starting their job hunt. I was there almost four years. I needed the money, so I put up with whatever crap was thrown at me. My boss was a guy we'll call Vince, not his actual name. Now Vince was not particularly good, but he sometimes respected the fact that I was the most tenured grunt in the organization. Do note that after about two years, I was doing a lot of additional work in addition to my official responsibilities, primarily because I was the only one who knew how to do those. Everyone else had already left. This will become important later. Enter Rajesh, not actual name. Rajesh was poached from a somewhat infamous company and was literally flown in from a different continent. He was brought in for strategically improving our division. This was quite strange given our division generated most profits. Within months, Rajesh made the environment even more toxic. He pulled Vince's team under him and got Vince fired, and he actively encouraged us grunts to spy on each other. Rajesh also had it out for me from day one. Till today, I don't know why. He started making my life more hard than others. This culminated in him taking me aside and telling me that I was not pulling my weight. Now at this point, I was doing quite well in the organization, and I had been doing a lot of additional work critical to our business since only I knew certain systems and processes. So I was quite angry. I started looking out. I still wasn't brave enough to quit and start looking. Fortunately, I was able to find a job that was willing to wait the three months. So it was my turn to take Rajesh aside and tell him that I quit. Boy, Rajesh was angry. He went from denial, you can't quit, to negotiation. What if I give you a raise at the end of the year? To acceptance. Thus, I was serving my notice and working away like an honest bee. My usual work plus the additional work. At this point, I was called by HR and told that Rajesh wanted me gone. The insane part was that they wanted me to pay the company for the two and a half month shortfall in notice. I obviously refused, then went back and checked the contract. Turns out a notice of less than three months could only happen through mutual consent and the initiating party, company if they wanted me gone sooner, or me if I wanted to leave earlier, had to compensate the other party for the shortfall. The next day I stopped doing almost all of my work. I logged in and logged out my hours and did nothing. I stopped doing any additional work I had been doing and started taking it really slow on my primary job responsibilities. Since no one else understood the details of what I did, I knew it would be really hard for Rajesh or HR to prove I was doing any of this on purpose. Then I sat back with my popcorn. Soon, there was a complete meltdown all around. Rajesh would pull me into meetings and scream and try to bully me, and I would say nothing but smirk to his face. Then they tried to have someone else learn the additional work I used to do for me so that they could do what I did. Remember I said earlier how I was the only one who knew some of the old systems and processes? Well, now I claimed I didn't really remember any of them, so obviously there could be no handover. Rajesh could do nothing as none of this had been my responsibility or part of my contract, since the leadership had been only too happy to see me do this for free. Soon, my workplace turned into a dumpster fire. The HR and Rajesh smartened up and offered to buy out my notice if I cooperated and helped transition my work. I refused. Then, to twist it further, I started having meetings with fellow grunts, Remember, everyone was always a newbie, and encouraged them to leave as well. Indirectly, nothing that could implicate me. HR tried to get me to leave twice more, but I ended up serving the full three months. It's like the company forgot that it was made up of people. When the people are gone, so is the company. 
American business owners think of their companies as machines that produce money for them. They often regard the humans who actually produce the value as easily replaceable parts inside of the machine. My aunt and uncle tried to get me fired over some crumbs, then it tore the family apart. This happened around five years ago. I was 23, female. At that time, I worked for a large cleaning slash maid service chain that specialized in both household cleaning and commercial cleaning. I don't mean to sound braggy, but I pride myself on my work ethic and ability to be highly productive. The first and only year they did this, I managed to get the employee of the year status out of thousands of employees amongst hundreds of branches across Canada and the US, which came to a cool $1,000 bonus. I was good at my job, did special little things for clients, like fancy towel, toilet paper folds, nice vacuum lines, and was requested very often by clients. I had never gotten a customer complaint in the five years that I had worked there. I don't know what happened with my mother's side of the family, but her siblings are all full brown backstabbing narcissists, some worse than others, that constantly make snide remarks. My mother is not as bad as them, but she definitely has some narcissistic tendencies as well. My grandmother is a sweet, open-minded, non-judgmental woman, so it baffles me that all four of her kids ended up being so crappy. The four of them all married equally as crappy people. Anyway, on to the story. My one aunt and uncle, who are the worst of the bunch, moved and needed a new house cleaner. They remembered that I cleaned houses, so they called my boss and signed up with a company I worked for, specifically requesting me. I came into work the next day and my boss tells me the news that my aunt signed up and asked for me to clean their house. Knowing how she and her husband are, I was very apprehensive and asked my boss if that was a good idea, as it would be a conflict of interest. Basically, I tried to say, no way, I ain't cleaning that jerk's house, in the most professional way possible. Well, regardless of my strong detest, my aunt was on the cleaning list the next day. I'll be honest, the first few cleans went totally fine. There were four adults living in my aunt's house at the time, my aunt, my uncle, their son, slash my cousin, who was in university, and my grandmother. So it was a lot of work to clean up after four adults in a huge house, but it was nice to see my grandmother every two weeks. And like I said, it was all going just fine. My grandmother and cousin were always home while I cleaned, and my aunt and uncle were usually at work. My gran was always so appreciative, saying how good of a job I do, and that she could see why I was deemed employee of the year. My mom was proud and told her about it. It was going fine, until one morning when I come into work and my boss has a confused and concerned look on his face. I ask him what's wrong and he states that my first complaint came in. I was shocked and at this point, after so many years, I was on a pretty personal level with all of my clients, so I figured if there was a concern, I would be told directly. My boss then says, and it's from your aunt and uncle. Shock turned into rage as my boss hands me over the printed out complaint email. I can't completely remember what it said, but I'll paraphrase as best as I can. I just remember it being extremely cold and I was being referred to as your staff. I guess I was not worthy of a name. Dear boss, Entitled Aunt and I are writing this email in regards to a clean we recently had done by your staff. To say it was subpar is putting it lightly. When Entitled Aunt and I got home from work, we found crumbs all over the kitchen floor. High dusting was not completed. The high dusting he was referring to were nine foot tall shelves. I'm not allowed to climb ladders due to liability reasons. Hallways were not vacuumed and some other things seemed intentionally missed. We are very disappointed in your staff and think they should be reprimanded. The cleaning is just simply not good enough. We are only 98% satisfied, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Regards, Entitled Uncle. I remember the email being about a page long, but that's basically the gist of it. My boss was shocked, I was shocked, and after explaining how my aunt and uncle are, he threw the complaint in the garbage. I told him I was not cleaning their house ever again, and he agreed this time. Hallelujah. I got home from work and was still upset about what happened. The fact that my family would try to get me reprimanded. The fact that they couldn't even use my name. The fact that they couldn't just come to me directly or email me if they had a concern. I called my mom and stepdad and told them what happened. I had taken a picture of the complaint email, so I sent it to them. They were upset, like more upset than I thought they would be. My stepdad called my uncle and told him he was a complete jerk, asked them exactly what their intentions were with that email and why they would go out of their way to try and get their niece fired or reprimanded. Who the heck does that to their own family? 
My uncle was a complete coward and groveled an apology with his tail between his legs. After he got chewed out by my stepdad, he called me. I let it go to voicemail. He left the voicemail basically saying, Why would you tell your parents about what happened? This was a professional matter that should have been kept between us and your work. The email was a misunderstanding. We're so sorry, Brookie. Oh, now I get a name? A nickname even? Please call me back so we can sort this out. I never called him back. I did send him an email though explaining why I was so mad that perhaps the two adults who are always home made some crumbs after I left and also why I was going no contact. Once the rest of my family caught wind of what happened, I think my aunt and uncle told everyone to try to get them on their side. Spoiler alert, no one took their side. My aunt and uncle's kids, my cousins, reached out to me personally to apologize for their parents' behavior. My grandma apologized for her daughter's behavior and this whole thing essentially tore the family apart. My grandma moved out not long after. My mom didn't talk to her sister for a year. My stepdad still hasn't spoken to either of them since, and I haven't spoken to my uncle since either. It's been five years. The son that doesn't live with them also went no contact for quite some time. There have also been no family Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter dinners since this happened. Everyone knew that they were jerks, but I guess this was just the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of my family. Not your fault. Your jerk aunt and uncle got what they deserved. And your uncle is horrible for coming after you after he got chewed out. Definitely keep that voicemail in case he tries to start crap again. Also, nice job on your boss for agreeing with you, because in some cases, the boss doesn't care to hear the story from the other side. OP. He was a great boss, part of the reason why I stayed so long. It's hard to find a job that is managed by someone who actually has empathy. Am I the jerk for skipping my best friend's wedding just because? I'm 31, female, and a hermit. I have exactly two friends, and I talk to them and to my family mostly online, meeting them only every now and then. I don't have social anxiety or anything, but people just drain me so much that I can barely function by the end of a workday. Just extremely introverted, I guess. I don't do social gatherings, and people who met me know this. Friend 1 got married last year. I showed up for the ceremony, dropped off my gift, and left before the reception even started. She thanked me for showing up at all. Barely an hour into the reception of my own brother's wedding, he told me that I'm free to go home now. He's surprised I lasted this long. The issue. Friend number two is getting married next year and she's planning a destination wedding. I'd like to make this clear. There's just no universe in which I'm flying six hours only to spend a full weekend socializing with people I don't even know. I told friend number two I will follow the ceremony online and give them my present after they return. She got upset and is currently giving me the I'm not mad, I'm disappointed routine. She said she's upset because I'm prioritizing my own comfort over her feelings. I told her she's right and that I will always put my comfort level above other people's feelings, hence the number of friends I have, and that she knew this very well from the start. Does that make me a jerky friend? Probably yes. It was one of the first things I said to her, we can be friends, but don't expect me to go to your wedding? Also yes. I do care about her feelings, and I did not mean to hurt her, but I also feel like she set us both up for failure with her expectations. Like, she doesn't know one of the reasons I don't do people is because I'm allergic to such expectations. On the other hand, I guess it's not unreasonable to expect your best friend to attend your wedding, so there's that. Am I the jerk? Choosing a destination wedding automatically means you have to accept some people won't attend solely because of that. I know, right? I certainly don't have the money or ability to take time off work for that crap. Not the jerk. But maybe you can make it up to her with a really special gift. But if not, you do you. The way this post is worded, it doesn't seem like you even have two friends, just two people you decided to tolerate. Frankly, I feel bad for them and bad for you. Relationships, regardless of platonic, romantic, or family, should enhance your life, not drain it. You sound like you may benefit from therapy. I vote you're the jerk only because in one breath you say you care about her feelings, but in the other breath you say, too bad, so sad, me first. I hope you find joy one day. It sounds like you desperately need it. You know, there are lots of people who get drained from socializing. Even when I'm around people that I absolutely love and would do just about anything for, what I cannot do is spend more than two to three hours with them at a time. It exhausts me completely. Not everyone gets energy from socializing, and we don't need therapy about it or to be told that we exist in the wrong way. We could just be simply introverted or we could be neurodivergent. Either way, leave us alone about it 
because we already go through enough about it. OP is definitely not the jerk. Edit. Whoa, thanks for the awards. It's amazing how many people can relate. Hope everyone's getting their support needs met and that we can all continue to understand and support each other better. You're the jerk. I'm basically a hermit too, so I get it. But when you prioritize your personal comfort over a huge event in your friend's life, you're clearly communicating what your priorities are. You can't expect that not to hurt people's feelings. It's a destination wedding though. That changes things. Travel can be incredibly draining even if you love all the people around you. You're the jerk. I'm introverted too, but I suck it up when someone needs me to be there for them. You're entitled to do what you want, yes, but don't be surprised when your two friends become one friend and your one friend becomes none. Friendship is a two-way street and it seems like your friends will soon realize you bring nothing to the table and why even bother anymore. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. OP's not the jerk, her friend is. Don't at me, bruh. Am I the jerk for giving my aunt back all the Star Wars stuff she gifted me? So my aunt for some reason thinks she decides other people's interests for them. She just gifts them a bunch of stuff from it, even if they like something else. She's done it since I was a kid. Example, my mom barely even drinks Coke, but she has tons of Coke products. A clock, a shirt, a blanket, a bear, cups, etc. Lately, she's been getting my 15-year-old brother in Minecraft stuff, which he doesn't play. I don't like Star Wars, never have. I tried watching a few of the movies and they didn't interest me. Since I was 11 or 12, I'm 17 now, my aunt gives me something Star Wars related for my birthday or Christmas. I literally have a shelf in my closet I put the stuff on because I won't wear it and I have no use for it, but every so often she'll bring it up to my mom so it's nice to have just in case. We've told her countless times that we appreciate the thought but those are things that we're not interested in. She just brushes it off and says, those are popular, or everyone likes Star Wars. I've tried telling her not to buy me anything, but she still does. Well, yesterday she came over for dinner and my mom said something about going shopping the next day. Then my aunt started with, well, he has a bunch of shirts I've given him over the years that I never see him in, so he definitely doesn't need shirts. I just sort of sat there. Then she looked at me and said, why don't you wear the stuff I give you? I said, because it's in my room. She got up and barged into my room, uninvited, then said, I don't see it. So I opened my closet. She said, you have it hidden in your closet? I was like, yeah, I don't like Star Wars, as I've told you a million times, so I stick it in the closet. She said, you might not like Star Wars, but you should at least use it and appreciate the gift. <laughs> I just stood there. She said, Either start using it or give it back and I'll just give it to someone that's not ungrateful. So I grabbed a box and put it in there and gave it to her. She said, I can't believe you're being so inconsiderate and hurtful and left. My mom said she can't believe I would do that. She said I should have just put one of the shirts on or some of the stuff out on a shelf in my room and then put it back when my aunt left. I'm just sick of my aunt acting like she can force us to like certain things. She asked for it back, so I gave it back. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your mom is a jerk for backing up the aunt instead of backing you up and enforcing your boundaries. Not to say how much of a jerk your aunt is. Next time you receive a gift you don't like, sell it or refund it and buy yourself something that you like. I was so ready to call you the jerk, but then I got to the end and she literally said to give it back if you weren't going to wear it. What did she expect? Not the jerk. OP. She expected me to put it on. She's been doing this crap since I was a kid. When I was like seven on my birthday, I was playing with my new toys. Every kid has a favorite gift they play with first. Well, I was playing with some car or something. My aunt said, you're making your aunt sad. If you don't play with the toy I gave you, I'm gonna have to give it to another kid. Am I the jerk for suing my ex after he destroyed my truck? I, 24 female, am suing my ex-boyfriend, 24 male, for destroying my pickup truck. I let my ex, at the time boyfriend, we'll call him Mark, and his friend, we'll call him Jason, who's 20, borrow my truck for an elk hunting trip in the Black Hills of South Dakota and Wyoming. I told Mark to take care of the truck because it meant a lot to me as it was my late grandfather's and he gave it to me before he passed. Well, Mark and Jason came back from the trip and my truck was in rough shape. The passenger side had an enormous scratch on it. The passenger side CV shaft was dragging on the ground, barely seated in the axle tube. 
The inch and a half bolts holding the axle tube to the frame were sheared off. My plastic snow gliders on the door were broken. The gas lines had been lacerated. The weather stripping was torn off both doors. The dash was torn apart and wires were hanging. My stereo plate was missing. The horn cover was missing. There were dents and scratches everywhere. Considering this truck was in pristine condition with no rust, dents, or scratches previously for an early 80s model Chevy, I was absolutely livid. Not to mention the caked on dirt, grass, mud, and clay everywhere. They didn't bother to wash it or even fill it with gas. It was bone dry. The damage to just fix the truck to make it drivable again cost me around $4,000 in parts. I needed a new front differential because all the fluid leaked out and wrecked the gears. The scratches and dents and cosmetic work are going to cost me a lot more. I also had to replace the gas lines, pump, and fuel tank because they ran it dry and burnt out the pump. At first, when I asked Mark and Jason what happened, they lied to me and said it was rough terrain and things like this happen. Parts get worn down and break. I knew this was BS as it was far from wear and tear damage. Well, Mark's brother, Dayton, 23, came in clutch with the actual story of what happened. Apparently, Mark was driving and Jason wanted to drive, in which I specifically said only Mark is allowed to drive. Jason grabbed the wheel, jumped a ditch, sideswiped a tree, and landed in a bush. I was furious with Mark as he lied to me, and I knew with him living paycheck to paycheck, he wouldn't be able to fix the truck. Shortly later, he broke up with me, and I was forced to move out of the townhouse that we were sharing. I'm sure this was to avoid paying me and or talking to me. So, to pay for all the damages, I'm suing him. His family has come after me on social media, stating I let him borrow the truck and I'm responsible for what happened to it, not him. I, of course, blocked all of them as I don't need their negativity. Not the jerk. Sue him for the damages. The truck was in his care when it sustained the damage, therefore he is responsible for paying for it. Fist Pounder Boss I'm a retired former investigator and can now share some insane stories. In my personal experience, 60% of the people were outstanding, 20% were pretty good, 15 were mediocre, and 5 were downright awful. Unfortunately, many of the awful ones got promoted. I've seen my share of fist pounders, chest thumpers, and screamers. You can't reasonably confront or stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them or you will lose and there will be consequences. For you. So many of us learned the skill of malicious compliance. We learned that if someone was going to pound their fist, make sure there is a thumbtack on the desk. If they're going to thump their chest, put a pin in their hand. Years ago, I was in charge of a program, which meant that I had the mind-numbing administrative task of handling the budget and purchasing supplies in addition to all the other duties. My then supervisor, Control Freak, was a fist pounder, chest thumper, and screamer. Boss was known for overworking his people, demanding 14 plus hour days and often seven day work weeks. Boss was just assigned to oversee my program and he summoned me into his office. Boss pounded his fist and demanded that I go through him and have him approve every supply purchase I made. So the next day I emailed him asking for an hour of his time to talk about pens. On the day of the meeting, I began with, Boss, I need to buy pens for the program. How many pens should I buy? Boss, I don't know, 50? Me, okay, 50. But what about the 0.5 or 0.75 point? How many of those and what brands? Boss, impatient shrug. How about half and half? Me, but we don't use much of the 0.75. It would be a waste. Okay, how about 70-30? Sounds good. <sighs> Fine, go do it. We're not done. We still need to talk about brands and red pens. What about markers? I chewed up an hour of his time talking about pens. Red pens, blue pens, multicolor pens, ballpoint or gel, sharpies, etc. When done, I said I needed an hour of his office time tomorrow to talk about paper. He broke in three days and angrily told me to get what I needed and just send him the receipts. Don't want anyone parking in front of your house? Okay, Karen, let's see what the cops think about that. So when I was around six years old, I lived with my family in a nice house in a small city in Poland. It was a quiet neighborhood on the outskirts and pretty much all the neighbors knew each other. There were no sidewalks around the part of the street that I lived on, only one crappy sidewalk that started on the other side in front of my neighbor's house. It's important to remember that the sidewalk was very old and in bad shape. Still to this day, people are asking the city to fix it. This story is about that neighbor, Karen. She was an older lady Everyone suspected that she really didn't have anything better to do than gossip and disturb everyone trying to rule the street. 
Everyone was commenting that if you wanted to get the whole area to know something, you had to tell her that message as a secret. Whenever someone came to visit us, they usually parked their car in front of our property. But on bigger meetups, like barbecues or parties, people would park in front of our closest neighbors' houses too. That never was a problem. No gates were obstructed and no one was disturbed. Well, almost. Karen hated when someone parked in front of her house. She would always run out yelling about, How dare you park your filthy car on my precious sidewalk? My mother is not someone that lets someone yell at her. She had many discussions with Karen about the laws and rules that stated that she doesn't own anything outside of her fence. Which means that the sidewalk is public and anyone can park on it as long as they leave enough space for a wheelchair to pass. That wasn't enough. Every time someone would come to us and park their car there, the yelling would start. Until one time when my mother's friend, Tomek, came for a coffee during winter. He's a local policeman and his specialty is road law. So my mother tells him about Karen and her behavior regarding the sidewalk. Tomek laughs since that thing was in such a bad shape that it can barely even be called a sidewalk. When he was leaving, he assured my mom that he would stop by the next day for a coffee on his lunch break. Next day comes by and I was playing with my brother in the snow. We see a black car pulling over in front of Karen's house and as the driver gets out, Karen storms out of her house yelling, You can't park here. This is my sidewalk. Get your filthy car off my property. Well, there he was, Tomek, with his full uniform, hat and all, turning around towards Karen as comically as he could. Tomek, excuse me? You tell me that I can't park my car here? Y yes But this is a sidewalk open to the public. Yes, this is my sidewalk. So let me get this right. This is your sidewalk? Yes. And you are the one responsible for taking care of it? Karen proudly. Well, yes, I am. That's why I don't allow anyone to park here. Tomek. Oh, that's so nice that I found you. So it's your sidewalk. You are responsible for clearing the snow from it to not create danger for the people walking on it. Since it was not plowed, I need to write you a fine for endangering public safety, he says as he pulls out his notebook. But no other sidewalks are plowed. Oh, it doesn't matter. The other sidewalks belong to the city. The clearing crew is working on cleaning them. But since this sidewalk is yours, it's your responsibility. But I'm old. I can't shovel the snow. Then you need to hire someone to do it. Of course, if the sidewalk happened to be of public property. Yes, yes, it's not mine. But a moment ago, you were yelling at me that it was. So what is it? Is it yours or not? Because I don't know if I should fine you now. No, it's not. All right, seems like we cleared that up. Now, if you ever harass anyone like you did with me, it could result in a fine. So I recommend you watching out on what you claim to be yours. And then he proceeded to cross the street and enjoy a coffee in our house. Karen never disturbed anyone for parking in front of her house again. She would only stare at people trying to burn holes in their skulls with her sight. My sister doesn't want to free her live-in unpaid maid, so I got her fired. Backstory Many of you have probably heard stories of families with strong hierarchy structure, normally with the eldest in the family having the most influence. My family is one of them, except that my parents are deadbeats, so my eldest sister, who's 31, our entitled mother, raised all five of us. She's the boss of the family. She says jump, everyone says how high. The focal point of the story is my younger sister, who's 20, we'll call her little sister. Most of us have a handful, or at least a couple of memories with our mother before she lost her crap, except for little sister. For her, entitled mother is the only mom she ever had, and entitled mother knows how to take advantage of that. All of us noped out of our parents' house as soon as we turned 18, except for entitled mother, who waited until little sister and our brother were raised and in their mid-teens to move across the country and soon found jobs and accommodations for all of us to move to the same state as her. Little sister begged for years to move in with her, but entitled mother always denied, saying that somebody had to take care of our father and because she and her new husband needed privacy and space. That was until entitled mother got pregnant. She got little sister to move in with her and she's been there for the past two and a half years helping out. Now to the story. Entitled father's family wanted to visit for a couple of weeks so little sister had to stay with me for that time so they could use her room. It's worth noting that Entitled Mother didn't ask or let me know about it. She just dropped little sister off. 
One day, she saw me studying for my master's degree and said something about how she always wanted to go to college, and this is how it went. Me. So, why don't you? Little sister. Oh, I talked to Entitled Mother about it, but she said not everyone is the college type and that I wouldn't have time to work, study, and take care of niece at the same time, and it's expensive. Me. Most people work and study at the same time, and she can put niece in a daycare. I'm sure it wouldn't be that much more expensive than what she's already paying you. Little sister. She doesn't pay me. She already gives me food and shelter, and if I need money, I just take a shift at work. And this is how I learned my sister was not only babysitting, but also cleaning the whole house for free every day. She was only working eight hours a week at her normal job because she was too busy taking care of our niece. Long story short, it took me weeks to convince her to apply to community college, and then more weeks on the actual process, but she finally got confirmation she would start in September. All of that behind Entitled Mother's back. She was planning on telling everyone the next time we all got together, which would be Independence Day. But before that could happen, Entitled Mother got everyone together at her house to announce that she was pregnant. Little sister starts crying because now she wouldn't be allowed to go to college. Entitled Mother gets deeply hurt and offended that she planned this behind her back. I butt in. Our other siblings butt in. It's just generally a mess. How could you do this to me? Who's going to take care of the babies? I can't believe you'd be so selfish. If you like OP so much, go stay with her. These were all some of the things she said. She kicked me and little sister out, who stayed with me until they made peace. Both of our siblings reached out, one to say that I should have minded my own business, and the other to tell me that she was on my side but wouldn't say anything. After that, little sister moved back with her and didn't go to college, but they agreed she would get paid $6 an hour and be allowed to take more shifts at her job until the baby is born, and then go to real college after the kid turns one year old. I know it's messed up, but all of them, especially my little sister, worship entitled mother like a god. I waited a year to act on my revenge, making sure my sister had saved up enough money to live on her own. The Revenge First, what I did was research the legality of paying a homeless person in food and shelter. In the US, and depending on the state, it's legal as long as you do not cross the line and the person becomes an employee. For example, you can give the person a list of tasks you want done, However, you cannot say it has to be done in a certain amount of time. You also cannot request someone to be somewhere at a certain time. You can ask, but not demand on the time. It comes down to a choice of words. Also, you have to comply with rental laws. If your local laws say that you must give 30 days notice to a tenant, then you must give 30 days notice to this person as well. I had proof of all of the situation. Several screenshots of entitled mother admitting to not paying and not allowing little sister to move out or get a job and also admitting to kicking her out whenever she wanted. All this technicality seemed worthless since no one would sue her, but that didn't matter. I just wanted to make sure that her boss knew that if she were to be sued, it would be a sure case. Entitled Mother works for a civil rights attorney's office, so discovering she has a literal modern-day slave would probably get her fired. I could have just created a burner email and sent it all to her boss, but then they would explain to her why she's getting fired, and that would get me and little sister in trouble. So, what did I do? Entitled Mother was always complaining about one of the bosses on her job that hated her and had tried to get her fired for ages. I went to the company's site, found the woman, thankfully she was the only Ashley that worked there, found her on Instagram and Facebook. There she had a post tagging her yoga studio. Went to said yoga studio and created my membership. It took a few weeks of trial and error trying to find exactly what class Ashley belonged to, but I finally found her. Then I went to yoga class every Tuesday and Friday at 8 a.m. for months, slowly building a friendship with her. Around three months in, she asked me to follow her on Instagram, and I was already prepared for this scenario, having deleted the few pictures I had with Entitled Mother. After nine months, when our friendship was a strong baby, I brought up the crazy coincidence that I found out she worked with Entitled Mother. Before things could get awkward, I said, It's ironic that she works for civil rights, considering, you know, everything. That got Ashley's attention. I told her everything, showed every screenshot. I could practically see her eyes shining. They had their own history that is not important to the story. All you need to know is, Entitled Mother is a jerk. Ashley wants revenge as much as I do. I told her about Little Sister's situation and why Entitled Mother couldn't ever know about this. This is why being friends with Ashley was so important. 
If I had just sent them the proof and explained the situation, they would have probably just ignored it since this was a very legitimate reason to fire her and they wouldn't risk firing her for a minor mistake and maybe getting sued. I sent her the files with her promise that Entitled Mother wouldn't hear about this, but she needed it to convince the other owner, who was the reason why she wasn't fired yet. Two months later, Entitled Mother was fired for her minor mistakes, lateness, and general bad productivity. Small victory, sure, but I loved coming to visit her during the four months she was unemployed. She was looking so tired and miserable all the time since she had no money to pay for a babysitter and little sister is away at college, so she actually has to take care of her kids. Am I the jerk for refusing to give my child-free eldest a family heirloom and giving it to my second eldest? I have two daughters, which are now grown up. One is 24 and does not plan on having kids, and one is 23 with a one-year-old daughter and frequently tells me she wants another one day. I'm happy for both of my daughters and support both of them infinitely. However, my great-grandmother has a necklace from roughly the 1880s which her mother had given her and supposedly told her son before she passed she wanted it passed on in the family which it has been. It was usually given to the eldest. It's now worth quite a bit of money. My eldest daughter and I were talking in which she expressed interest in inheriting the necklace. When I asked her why she seemed so keen to get it, she started talking about the nice holidays she could have with the money that she wouldn't normally be able to afford. I reminded her it's not to be sold, it's to be passed along the family as a sentimental piece, in which she said she will not be having kids and therefore there will be nobody to pass it to. I suggested that she give it to her niece, in which she shut down saying it's her necklace and she can do whatever she wants with it. There's no specific family rule saying it belongs to the eldest, that's just how it's traditionally done. So I'm set to give it to my second eldest, who was delighted to keep it as a family heirloom and give it to her daughter. My eldest is furious, claiming that I had promised her the necklace from a young age, which is not true as she was never promised anything, and that I gave it to her sister because she's more traditional and gave me a grandkid. She said that the necklace would have given her a chance to make memories with her partner, which she can't usually afford due to her salary being low, while her sister has more money and wouldn't need it. She said the woman who asked for it to be passed along passed over a hundred years ago and isn't alive to miss it. She's refusing to speak to me and her sister for accepting it. The only choice of hers I take issue to is selling the necklace that was supposed to be passed along. I love my daughter, but I believe she's being entitled, but I do not want to lose her over this. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You're not not giving it to your older daughter because she's child free. You're not giving it to her because she's planning to sell it. Very different things. This. And if the person who started it passed a long time ago and their wishes don't matter anymore, the unspoken rule of passing it to the eldest daughter doesn't matter either. So you, as the current owner of the necklace, get to decide what to do with it. She can't have it both ways. If she wants to dismiss the tradition of passing it along, she can't invoke the same tradition to demand it. And you're still alive, so according to her logic, your wish for it to be passed along generations should be respected. Who looks at a hundred-year-old family heirloom that's been passed down for generations and thinks, this would make a mighty fine vacation to some far-off locale that I can't normally afford? Not the jerk. Plus, she's likely wrong. Old jewelry is usually not worth that much. I have several antique pieces with diamonds and had them appraised for insurance value. Even though they're all over a century old, none of them are worth more than a few hundred dollars. Unless the piece has huge rocks or belong to someone famous, you're not likely to get much for it. Would I be the jerk if I cancel my daughter's celebratory trip because I need to be somewhere else? I've always promised my daughter that after her final exam results, UK, kids are on their last week, she can finally travel alone and take a holiday with her friends before uni. My daughter and her friends have been planning it for a while and me and the other girl's parents are funding the trip and are all excited for them to finally travel on their own. They have planned for it to be a week long. But I just found out that my sister will be having her first baby, my nephew, and has invited me to spend the week with her, her partner, and the baby. And it's the same week my daughter would be away. And I desperately want to be with my sister and spend time with the newborn, but it would mean traveling across the country for a week. Where my sister lives is further into the countryside and often has dodgy reception, so chances are I wouldn't be receiving many calls there. I feel pretty uncomfortable with my daughter being away when I'm not home, because what if she had an emergency and needed me to come get her? I probably wouldn't get her calls, and if I did, I wouldn't be in the right position to plan something for her. 
Obviously, the ideal situation was for me to be at home so I could be easily accessible to her. Will I be a huge jerk if I withdraw my daughter from the trip? She's been looking forward to it for years, but my nephew will only be a newborn once and my daughter has her whole life to travel. Would I be the jerk? I'm very stressed out about this, but I'm pretty sure of my decision to withdraw her. Just want to make sure it won't hurt her. Post edit. Thank you to the parents and the kids telling me that it would hurt her. I'm still uncomfortable not being home when she's away, so I think I'll just visit my sister another time. Like someone said, my nephew isn't going anywhere. I was putting him over my daughter. Thank you for helping me see this. You're the jerk. Your daughter is traveling alone and is a young adult. Your presence at home is not needed. Just coordinate for your daughter to have a secondary emergency contact if she temporarily can't reach you. I'm assuming that these are high school finals, like the kids are going to college. You really need to not helicopter parent and let your kid just go learn to be an adult. In my opinion, you would be the jerk. I completely understand you wanting to be with your sister and her newborn, but your kid has to take priority. As you've said, they've been planning it for a while and they're traveling on their own. There's no real reason for you to cancel it given that you don't need to be present. You might have bad reception, but you can organize with your daughter who she can call in case of emergency. If there was an emergency at home, you still wouldn't be reachable. Stay home, visit the newborn another week. I'm sure your sister will happily reschedule and the long holidays are only a stone's throw away. I live in a bad reception area in England. The trick? Wi-Fi and WhatsApp. It's not really that difficult to ensure you can get a call even when traditional signal options are dicey. Family keeps complaining about medical care, so the nurses get family involved in patient care. Patient came in and develops difficulty swallowing, so the poor patient can't eat or swallow without choking and possibly acquiring an infection. Doctors put in a tube in patient's stomach to feed them with liquid food and bypass the esophagus. At first, patient was being fed through a slow drip controlled by a machine. Then family complained that patient wasn't tolerating the continuous feed, so the doctor took the machine away, and now I and the other nurses would have to go in the room three times a day to feed patient manually. Family complained the next day that the patient's stomach was bloated, so the doctor changed order to four times a day, a nurse would have to go in there to feed the patient. Next day, family complained patient wasn't going to the bathroom, after not eating for several days and undergoing a surgery, so that's to be expected. But the doctor caved to the family's complaining and changed the order to every four hours. Then family freaked about patient being short of breath and blamed the liquid tube feed. Even though the patient has a history of respiratory disorders and is on chronic oxygen, still the doctor changed the order to every three hours a nurse has to go in and manually feed the patient through the tube in her stomach. I know I was fed up with the family complaining about every tiny little thing and more so at the doctors for caving in without explaining the reality of the patient's condition. The patient is old as heck and probably won't get better. Family complained again the next day, claimed the patient was having chest pain, red flag for a heart attack, but the family blamed the liquid tube feed. Why? The doctor caved again and changed the order to every two hours. Every two hours, I or whoever was taking care of the patient would have to go in there and spend 20 minutes in the room dealing with the patient and her family. As many people now know, nurses do not have time to mess around. We barely have time to go to the bathroom. So, malicious compliance. This patient is not going to get better, so family needs to know how to feed her through the tube. I educate the family and show them how to do it at 6 p.m. I make sure to turn on all of the lights, turn the TV off, and get the family really involved. They wash their hands, they put on gloves, handle the tube, etc. Then at 8 p.m., I make the patient's son do the tube feed. It takes half an hour and I can tell he's really freaked out. Then I go back in at 10 p.m., midnight, 2 a.m. By 4 a.m., the son was complaining that I should be the one doing the tube feedings because it's so often. He looks exhausted and terrible. I tell him flatly that it's not rocket science and that he's going to be doing the tube feedings himself at home, by himself with no backup nurse. He takes forever to do the 4 a.m. tube feed because he's so tired. Afterwards, while he's watching me clean up the patient, he comments that the patient seems to be tolerating the tube feeds better and maybe we can go back to doing it every three to four hours instead of every two hours. I look him dead in his bloodshot eyes and say that when the doctor orders something, then there's no wiggle room. It's literally the law. Because of the family's multiple concerns, it's every two hours until the doctor signs a new order and that I'm going to be coming in flipping all the lights on every two hours until I go home. The look of defeat on the son's face was so sweet 
and almost made the every two hours nonsense worth it. Awful post and terrible attitude towards the family. Your issue is with the doctors who aren't managing the family's expectations or ensuring they fully understand the situation. If my family member is in the hospital, I will advocate for them as best as I can. I don't care if it means extra work for the nurses or doctors, if it's in the best interest for the patient. If it isn't, then the doctor needs to explain and discuss that with me. You shouldn't be a nurse. Imagine bragging on Reddit for karma that you did this to a family dealing with a terrible illness of a loved one. You are literally a jerk. Do your job with empathy. This ticks me off. How is this the family's fault? They have no education on this and now a burnt out nurse gets upset so takes it out on the family when it's the issue of the doctor. Yes, you are overworked. Why not educate the family about the reality of it instead of doing this to her son? Good on you. As a Paul Care and aged care nurse, I feel your frustration so much. It's so messed up when doctors fail to have realistic conversations with family and let them make ridiculous choices like this. You handled it perfectly. I find it crazy when it's even an option to put a feeding tube in someone at the end of their days. It's cruel and just prolonging the inevitable. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for how she handled this or not? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for effectively making my sister homeless? So I know how that sounds bad, but hear me out. My sister lived with my aunt for six years. When my aunt passed two years ago, she left the house to my mother instead of my sister because my sister's never been able to hold down a job and has been evicted three times for failure to pay. My mom told her she could continue living in the house, but that she would have to pay the taxes and the homeowner's insurance, about $190 a month, plus the electric bill. Well, about midway through last year, she's yet to pay anything during the month and came to find out she had never put the electric bill in her name and had rang up almost $3,000 on my aunt's account. So having had enough, my mother gave her 30 days to be out last July. When November rolled around and she still hadn't left, me and my mother went down there. She admitted that she had never told her boyfriend that they were being kicked out and that they hadn't even looked for anywhere to go. Around this time, I offered to buy the house for my mother and that I would just start the process to evict them through the courts. My mother volunteered to just give me the house so I could raise my family in it. It's about three times bigger than my current home. It's 3,600 square feet. Well, last month, I filed the unlawful detainer Two weeks ago, we had court and she cried and cried in front of the judge who ultimately told her that I had the deed so she has no lease and upon seeing all of the bills my mother has had to pay to keep the house from being seized, told her to get out within 10 days. Well, yesterday was day 10 and they still haven't packed a single thing so I filed to have the sheriff's department remove her by force. The department posted on her door that if she wasn't out within 72 hours, she would be charged with trespassing. She and her boyfriend have been texting me almost non-stop telling me I need to rescind it because they're going to be homeless and how could I do this to family? I don't think I'm in the wrong. They've had a year to figure this out. My mother's had to pay their light bill for almost a year because they wouldn't let her just turn the power off because of lockdown. I look at it that every decision she's made in her 35 years of life has led her to this. So am I wrong? And before people start mentioning it, I don't care if I don't have a relationship with her after this. Things have always been strained between us anyway. Not the jerk. Sounds like your sister and her boyfriend need a serious wake-up call. Sucks that it has to be you to provide it, but honestly, you're doing something that in the long run might end up doing good for her. Not the jerk. There's a very thin line between loving and enabling. It sounds like your sister, who's a grown woman, has been blurring that line and taking advantage of your family's willingness to provide for her for a very long time. She had ample warning. You and your mom gave her every opportunity and plenty of time to find a new place. Every single time, your sister chose instead to continue to test the boundary and see how much longer she could squat. It eventually blew back on her and she's got no one to blame but herself. I imagine she's had some struggles in her life if this is how she functions or fails to as an adult. As sad or unfair as those outside circumstances may be, it's definitely not your problem and no longer your mom's problem either to go out of your way to fend for her. Am I the jerk for rejecting my mom's request for my fiancé slash wife and I to share our home with a stranger? Hope everything's well on your side. I, 30 male, live in the highest COL place in the world. To give some context, everything in New York City looks affordable by comparison. I was gifted the down payment for a home after I proposed to my girlfriend of six years, a portion of which I will repay over time. In most families, this would be regular visits, physical labor, 
helping the family to cover large purchases, etc. Now my mom is angry that I don't want to share my house with a stranger. I'm eternally grateful for the opportunities for my parents and grandparents. Great education, steady shelter, and skipping the regular Asian parents' income tax because my income has been pretty low the past few years. That said, I do cover large purchases at home. My parents can also be incredibly difficult. Both have zero sense of personal boundaries and are hugely controlling. Also, my father has anger issues and plays favorites, to the point he admits it openly. While my mother is the classic type A, demanding, ambitious, often emotional, anxious, the last few years have been especially rough with all the misinformation. I just don't have the strength to deal with them anymore. So when I got a big promotion, plus successfully proposed to my girlfriend of six years, she said yes. I was excited to have a legitimate chance to move away without hurting their feelings. Things were even better when they and my grandparents decided to gift me the down payment for my home, though I will need to repay some of it back to them later. The rest of my house will be paid for with my own money and mortgage, even though I did mention I may need temporary aid if something happens to my job, just in case. Here's when trouble arrived. My grandpa recently became ill. He's over 95 years old and needed a live-in nurse. She would sleep during the day and monitor him during the evening, so she needs a bed in a room. My parents' and grandparents' home are already packed with medical stuff, so that is an issue. During conversation with my mom last night, out of nowhere, she joked that it would be perfect for the nurse to live at my place. It was not a joke. I manage a team of 30 people at work, but nothing has prepared me for this. The nurse is a stranger to me, save for a few highs and buys. I'm not prepared to give a stranger, or my parents, free access to the home while we are bone chicka wowing, trying to sleep at night, or working in the office during the day. Am I to install cameras inside my home? How am I even supposed to tell my fiance about this? I asked my mom the above. Her response in the moment of frustration was that I should simply tell my fiance this is happening. Something about how we paid for the house and that she'd be bad wife material if she isn't willing to follow our house rules. My mom also criticized me for being selfish, for not willing to share my apartment with a stranger nurse. I understand the nurse will be a huge help, I really want to help too, but this living arrangement seems crazy. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. The money for the house was not a gift. You have the expectation of paying that back, so it's a loan. You don't owe favors for loans. An alternative is using some of the space in your house to store equipment they don't need at the moment. Not the jerk. This is a big, unreasonable ask. Surely they can clear a room, put stuff in storage perhaps. There are other ways. Your parents sound intrusive and are guilt-tripping you for a loan you are going to repay. Excuse me, why is there an automatic 18% gratuity for parties of six or more? Because large parties are an extra burden to bear. Because if one person's section is bogarted by a large party, their night is sink or swim based on your charity. Because the number one reason service staff will have a breakdown or spontaneously quit their job is getting done over on a large bill. Automatic gratuity is there to protect the staff and the business. Cue this one high-maintenance sort and his family of 12. Despite their best efforts to run me ragged, everything went super smooth and genial. Then came the bill. Uh, excuse me, but why is there an 18% gratuity? I'd like to write in my own tip. And you can. There's a line below where you can add whatever you'd like on top of the gratuity, and it's much appreciated. No, no, no. I'm talking about the principal. I always tip above 20%. Big, uh-huh, moment. But having it forced on the customer feels unfair. Me, playing coy. Well, if you wanted to tip above 20%, you can just add the 2% or whatever on the tip line underneath. It's the principal. I just thanked him and walked away. He sat there stewing for 15 minutes while his family was polishing off desserts and gathering their things to leave a situation best ignored until they leave. And sure enough, he had signed the bill. No extra tip. Shocked Pikachu face. But managed to write out an entire novel on the front and back of his bill, addressed to the owner, detailing why automatic gratuities are the worst thing ever and how much more he would have tipped if it wasn't an imposition. Basically could have just written underneath, too long didn't read, I'm a cheap jerk. One of my first service jobs was at a corporate place where the gratuity was conditional on large parties and at best you could only ask the party for permission to apply it. Most said sure, fine, but of course. 
So one night, my entire section is cordoned off for a large party of 20, mostly teenagers, and they did that obnoxious crap, like ordering steaks well done, eating half of it, then complaining they want a new one, or asking for extra drinks when I was explicit about no free refills, but still complaining when the bill came, etc. I was gutted because I knew what was coming with the $400 bill. Hey, you guys cool if we add a gratuity? What's that? It's an 18% tip added to the bill to ensure staff, nah, it's cool, we got you. Long sigh and head down in shame. They left me 15 bucks. My tip out on the party was 20 and I would never do over the rest of the staff, so I took a net loss of $5 for the night. I was shaking and ready to quit. Managers were all, bummer, but it's like that, see you tomorrow. I worked the slow lunch shift the next morning and as soon as the rush was starting to hit, the general manager comes up to me. Hey, I'm gonna cut you and send you on break for a couple of hours. I'm gonna need you to come back in tonight. I was so checked out. No, I'm not scheduled and already have plans. Sorry, his eyes got big. The next morning, I tried clocking in and the point of sale didn't recognize my number. GM had decided to can me on some trumped up BS, but it was clearly because I had been insubordinate. Good riddance. New neighbors keep using our pool without permission. Should I call the cops on them? I'm 32, female. My wife and I finally bought our own home instead of renting. It took a lot of work, but we did it, and it's a home we both love and plan to spend the rest of our lives in. It even has a pool, which is just amazing and something I'd always wanted but never thought I'd have. The issue is our next door neighbors. I keep finding their kids using our pool, having hopped our fence, and I keep getting them to leave. I've spoken to their parents about this issue and they've told me that the elderly couple we bought the house from would let them use the pool in exchange for cleaning it, so they're just used to being able to use it. I told them that was fine when it was the last neighbor, but it's something my wife and I are not comfortable with as we don't know them well enough. Plus, if they were to get hurt, we'd feel awful about it. They insist that nobody would get hurt and asked if it would be okay if they used it whenever we weren't using it, as they're just kids, and spoke about how it's getting hotter now. I was getting annoyed at this point and told them they should get their own pool then and I'd already told them we weren't comfortable with this. Ever since then, I've had to chase them away a couple more times and their parents are constantly sending me dirty looks whenever they see me. I've since posted a sign stating it's a private pool and can only be used with permission. Am I really being unfair here? Yes, it sucks that they had an arrangement with the last owners, but it's our pool now. Not the jerk. You know those parents would sue you into the next century if someone got hurt in your pool. You need to have your pool totally fenced off with a locking gate. I would also report the kids to the police as trespassing, if only to put the parents on notice. OP should tell the neighbors that next time they will call the cops. And if they don't take the warning seriously, actually call the cops. OP has already put signs up and everything, and the law is on OP's side. You are wrong. The law is not on OP's side. A pool is an attractive nuisance, and regardless of signs, fence, etc., OP is liable. I had all the stuff, fence, alarm, etc., and lost a lawsuit when a known neighborhood nuisance hopped the fence, was drunk, and ended up passing. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you let them use your pool or not? Please let us know. Absolutely not. It's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Am I the jerk for not wanting to exclude my wife and kids from a trip? I, 28 male, have five kids with my wife, who's 32. Please don't come after us for how many kids we have. I work roughly 50 hours a week, 10 hour days Monday through Friday, and my wife is a stay at home mom. She does the majority of everything, cleaning, cooking, everything minus the shopping, which my wife orders online and I pick up at the store. So here's the am I the jerk scenario. My work schedules a work bonding fishing trip from Friday night to Sunday over the summer. I say no way I'm going for the following reasons, despite my wife telling me to go and have fun. First of all, every Saturday I schedule my wife for some type of treat yourself appointment and send her on a mini shopping spree slash kiddo free morning to do whatever she wants with one rule, the kids stay at home. It's about her and her only. Second, I'm not leaving my wife for two nights and a day for fishing and drinking. If I wanna go fishing, I'll take the five year old twins with me to give my wife less to juggle and create some memories. Third, the ladies that work at the office feel excluded because they don't like fishing. Fourth, they call it a stag weekend, despite no one getting married. And I don't trust that phrasing, especially since they're going fishing near a very popular college-age vacation spot 
known for the bars and the wasted weekend shenanigans. So my coworkers have been calling me whipped since I said no and saying it'll give them a chance to know me better since I don't go out with them on Wednesday when they go to the bar and have always missed the trip. All my coworkers all have wives, kids, or significant others, so I recommended we do a family camp out during the planning meeting, which would cost the same amount, and do those blow up things on the lake, boating if you have one, skis, etc., and do a cookout kind of deal with family activities with my work renting small cabins for families to use. My regional manager who was at the meeting loved it even more than the fishing trip, gave me a yearly bonus to plan this family event every year instead of my coworker who gets one to plan the fishing trip. Now my coworkers are calling me whipped and more stupid names, and they're mad because their wives are happy about my idea. Their wives have even emailed me about a mom Saturday morning idea, like my wife has, and I added it into the plan, and are mad that their stag weekend is canceled and quote, spend a work paid trip babysitting. So Reddit, am I the jerk for getting a work trip canceled and replaced with a family friendly event? Edit for clarity. I also included the child free coworkers of mine in the planning and said if they need a break or are getting overwhelmed, they're more than welcome to borrow my boat for relaxing without the kids or for more extreme water sports. It's not babysitting if it's your own kids. You're being considerate to your wife and it sounds like you're a good husband. You're not the jerk. Yeah, how dare OP want to not exclude his wife, coworkers wives and the kids to go on a stag weekend where you know questionable things will happen and instead make it a fun experience for everyone instead of letting the guys run off to do who knows what for a weekend and leave their wives and kids at home. It sounds like a lot of fun and the guys are the ones with the problem thinking spending time with their own kids is babysitting. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. You came up with an idea that would benefit everyone and not leave anyone out. I find it weird that a workplace would even have such an exclusive fishing trip to begin with. I'd bet the women have been trying to get the trip changed for years but no one would listen to them. It definitely sounds like they felt left out. If the fishing trip is that important to them, they can still go and pay for it themselves. Literally nothing is stopping them from doing so. The fact that they see having to spend a weekend with their kids as babysitting tells me all I need to know about them. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for getting the trip changed or not? Please let us know. OP sounds delightful. He also sounds like you'll have quite a few enemies at the office from now on. Am I the jerk for telling my daughter that I can't compete with her stepmom and that if she can't cope with it, she should live there full time? 15 years ago, I, 19 at the time, dated this guy, Mark, who was 25. I got pregnant after a few months with him. I wasn't ready for a kid, so I gave Mark full custody of our daughter, Natalie, who's now 14, and I'd visit a couple of times a year. Mark is from a good family and already had a great job when we first met. He quickly climbed up the ladder and was able to give Natalie a very privileged life. When Natalie was two, he met Amy and they got married when Natalie was four. Natalie and Amy have always been very close and Amy is very much involved in her life. She's room mom, head of the PTA. She was the soccer coach, the softball coach, head of the theater guild and found a way to be part of everything Natalie was involved in. She also drives Natalie to school early in the mornings so they could stop for breakfast first and she packs Natalie's lunch every day and not something like peanut butter and jelly in a bag of chips. She makes Natalie steak or quiche or lettuce wraps with a side of salad with homemade dressing, fresh fruit, and homemade dessert. Natalie doesn't understand that the only reason Amy is able to do all of this is because she doesn't work and she doesn't have to do much around the house. They have a cleaning service come multiple times a week. I recently got an apartment close to Mark and Amy's house and I have Natalie one week out of the month now. It was pretty hard for both of us at first. Natalie had a hard time understanding that we're not stopping for breakfast before school and the best thing she's going to get from me for lunch is a turkey sandwich, cookie from the grocery store I work at, a bag of chips, and an apple. She was also not used to the fact that she has to clean up after herself. Natalie was here last week and we were already not getting along because she had an event at school that week that she told Amy about and not me, because she refused to clean her room and because I found out she's been throwing away the lunches I make for her and asking Amy to bring her lunch since she started staying with me. She had a sore throat on Wednesday and I let her stay home from school, then started to get ready to leave for work. When I was about to leave, she made a comment that Amy always stays home with her when she doesn't feel well. I said it's a sore throat and she'll be fine, but she got an attitude and said that I should try to be a good mom like Amy. We ended up arguing and I told her that I can't compete with Amy and that if she can't handle that, she needs to go back to her dad's house. So she called Amy to pick her up and I haven't heard from her since. I was supposed to take her out for dinner this Saturday, 
but now she doesn't want to go, so I wanted to know if I was the jerk. You're the jerk. Your daughter may have your DNA, but you aren't her mother. She's been through a dramatic change when you stepped back into her life. Because of that, your expectations for this relationship aren't realistic. She's 14, and you literally abandoned her at birth. You have a golden opportunity to get to know the young woman she's becoming, but you've turned this situation into a competition between you and her mother. You cannot blame her at all for not wanting to spend time with you. I don't understand how OP turned it into a competition. Given the example provided in the post, what was she supposed to do? Miss work to stay home with Amy and lose money and day off for a non-emergency? Just because her stepmother doesn't work and could actually stay with Amy in such a situation because she A. is not employed, B. doesn't rely on the money from work. There was a no win for OP there. The kid literally demands stuff OP can't provide, like breakfast at cafes, because she cannot afford it on a single income, presumably. Your comment contains no actual advice of what she was supposed to do apart from generic, do better. Edit. Just to clarify, there are different issues here. OP is not the jerk for the situation described in the post, and that's what I refer to in this comment. However, she appears to be the jerk for forcefully inserting herself into the life of this teenager by fighting Natalie's parents in court for custody, instead of simply agreeing to visitation rights. All this presumably in response to Amy wanting to adopt. Not the jerk. I think you need a full stop and try to imagine how you'd feel if you were your daughter. She's been given a very nice life by her father and stepmom. You were rarely in the picture, and that's when it suited you. Now you decided to become a mom, and you think this human whom you birthed should be so happy to have you in her life. I wouldn't. I'd be upset if I had to leave the comfort of my home to go stay with a stranger for a week every month, simply because she decides to move close enough that it's convenient for her. You've uprooted her. You're not helping her to adapt. You expect her to be happy you're around, and you're mad because she isn't. You pull her away from her comfort for an entire week and take her to a place that's clearly less than she's accustomed to, and you're mad because she's not happy? She's 14. 14 year olds aren't happy anyway, and you're giving her way more reasons to be unhappy. From here, all I see is a teenage daughter that wants to connect more with you and is constantly being met with, I'm not willing to try, go get your needs met elsewhere. Then she does, by asking Amy to bring her lunch, and you also get angry. She was not feeling well and needed someone to take care of her. She asked you, as another way to connect, and you dismissed her once again. She doesn't want you to compete with Amy. She wants her mother to make her feel like she is a priority. Most people just can't take time off of work that easily. And let's be honest, a 14-year-old with a sore throat can stay home alone. My 11-year-old stays home alone when she's not feeling well. Honestly, the kid sounds very spoiled and privileged. Going out to breakfast every morning, getting fancy lunches, that's great, but she's old enough to understand that not everyone can afford that. OP and kids should consider therapy together to talk about this stuff with an unbiased party. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her daughter? Please let us know. This plot would have made for such a good movie back in the 90s. Am I the jerk for publicly calling out my fiancé at our party after he made a dig at my previous homelessness? Going to go straight to it. Last Sunday, I organized a small barbecue party with my work friends, my fiancé's family, as well as other acquaintances to celebrate my promotion at work. I know it might come off as arrogant to celebrate a promotion, but the reason why I held it was because this was one of the first times in my life I felt settled and at peace. I was homeless for a while and had to work really hard and rely on my one kind relative who supported me to get to where I am. The party was also held to express my gratitude towards my uncle and my friends who helped me push through. However, not everything went smoothly. My fiancé was introducing me to some of his friends and colleagues after we set up the food. He kept introducing me to them in a condescending way, saying that the promotion didn't really mean a huge pay raise and his salary is still higher than mine, even though he started work much earlier than me, and that the only reason I made it was because of my relative. That is somewhat true. But the thing that struck me the most was him saying jokingly to his friends that he played a huge role in where I am today even though I literally met him after I landed my job, and that my homelessness was not a big deal because I only spent six months being homeless before my relative helped. It just felt humiliating and invalidating, so I also jokingly retorted back, saying, at least I'm not a trust fund baby who was handed everything in life and had his parents pay part of his mortgage. His colleagues laughed at that, and I could see my fiancé was not pleased. He stopped mocking me after, thank goodness. But after everyone left, he mentioned that what I said really ruined his image. I told him I was merely imitating his actions 
because he could clearly see I was uncomfortable and carried on, and then he denied it and proceeded to call me sensitive. Now I'm confused. I know what I did was wrong. I was not behaving or communicating like an adult. And yes, I shouldn't have divulged the fact that his parents paid part of the down payment, but I was hurt and had no way to pull myself out mid-convo without embarrassing myself. That's why I require judgment if I am the jerk I'm willing to apologize. Why is this not your ex-fiance? Not the jerk. You ruined his image? What about how he ruined yours? He's not always like this. In fact, the very reason we got together was because he admired my grit, and then for him to turn around and do this, quite disappointed. I wouldn't say my image is ruined or something, because my friends and uncle don't care about all that. But yeah, towards his friends, it made me feel small and stupid. He admired your grit for as long as he feels you were not a threat to his ego, for as long as you remained beneath him. This is a party to celebrate your achievement, but he chose to highlight that you didn't get to where you are via your own hard work, that you had to be helped by others, thereby undermining your success. Also, the fact that he was saying that it doesn't mean anything because OP's salary is not higher than his? Big red flag. Not the jerk. You say he admired your grit and isn't normally like this. Well, you were never at risk of upstaging him before. You were never at risk to his ego before. He admired you when he considered himself better than you. He then, instead of apologizing for his behavior, knuckled down and called you sensitive. This is downright disgusting. You're sensitive because you voiced how he embarrassed you? You're sensitive because you told him that you were uncomfortable? He then denies his treatment of you being bad and denies knowing how you felt about the situation. I'm sorry. Who goes around telling others about their partner's homelessness and how they wouldn't be anywhere without XYZ handout? Then try and claim that their partner is only where they are today because of them? When they did nothing? And I'm sorry. Was his parents paying part of his mortgage some big secret? He just wants to look better in the eyes of his coworkers and will trample on anyone to do so it seems. You should be proud of your accomplishments. If he does not come and apologize to you for this, then boot him to the curb. Welcome to your future of him embarrassing you as you threaten his fragile ego. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her fiance? Please let us know. I'd run from him faster than Usain Bolt. I went out with people who didn't tip and I feel horrible. My boyfriend's mom and I were celebrating our birthday, April 30th and April 28th at a seafood restaurant with my boyfriend's sister and my boyfriend. The service was cool. It wasn't slow and the waitress wasn't rude or anything. When it was time to pay, me and my boyfriend's bill was about $68. I put in $70 and was going to add $5, thinking everyone, four of us, was also going to add a similar amount. My boyfriend took the $5 and said that the leftover change was enough. That change was like $1 and some cents. I tried to explain to him that that wasn't enough, thinking that his mom would speak up, but his mom and his sister both said that they weren't leaving a tip because the waitress, husband slash family owned the place and they had money. Imagine my horror when I heard that. She gave us good service, kept our drinks refilled, and y'all just aren't gonna tip? Then when his sister paid, her leftover change was like $3 and the waitress didn't give her the change back and the sister literally waited for her to speak to her so she could give it back. I went to the bathroom so they could leave so I could give a bigger tip, but when I came out, I didn't see the waitress and everyone was in the car waiting. I feel so bad. I can't believe they just refused. I went to a restaurant with my mom and my family the following day and my mom paid for three meals and I left a $10 tip for us three and still my mom left a few extra dollars. Your values are different. This should key you in. I feel like this comes up on other subreddits all the time. The question, what's a red flag or a deal breaker on a first date? And I always think being rude to a server. I haven't served in over 10 years and I don't think I could be with someone who was a bad tipper. Think of how many times over the course of the relationship the issue will keep coming up. That's just a fundamental incompatibility. You are 100% on point. I've always totally judged a person and how they treat a server. It shows how they will be to someone in a lesser position of power, which is a good insight into character. We have a pretty high-powered lawyer who comes into our joint a couple times a week. Dude bills at $1,450 an hour and treats the cashier or the guy doing street sweeping, or me, the owner, the same at all times. And one of my favorite tricks when meeting new people who ask what I do is to tell them lots of dishwashing and hauling trash and see how they respond. It is very telling. Insist on ordering food despite having the wrong number? Fine by me. This happened when I still lived with my parents over 20 years ago in a small town just outside a small city. 
As a teenager with a bit of social anxiety, I would spend most Friday and Saturday nights at home watching movies, playing Legos or computer games. Often, my parents would go out in the city as there was nothing to do in the town, so I would be home alone until late at night. Our landline phone number was very similar to that of a local Chinese takeaway and taxi company. I won't give the exact numbers, but to give an idea, our number was 12222, the Chinese takeaway was 12221, and the taxi firm was 122122. So on a Friday slash Saturday night, drunken state, it was very easy to misdial. 99% of the callers would apologize once they advised they had the wrong number, and I would even be able to tell them the correct number to dial. The 1%, however, the instance that I recall and fits this sub goes as follows. Me. Hello? Caller. Hi. I'd like to order one sweet and sour, one chow mein. Me interrupting. I I'm sorry. This is the wrong number. Caller. No. This is the Chinese food place. Me. I'm sorry. It really isn't. You need to call one two. Caller interrupts me. Yes, it is. So take my order now. Quite rude and forcefully. Me. Fine. What do you want? Caller gives me his order. Me. Okay. Are you collecting or you want this delivered? Delivered. And quickly. Me. Okay. It'll be about 30 minutes. I hang up. 45 minutes later, the phone rings. I answer and there's one hungry customer on the phone. Me. I'm sorry. You didn't leave your address for the delivery and 1471 didn't work. UK readers will know this, but it's basically a service to call back your last received caller. So we waited for you to call back. Food will be another 30 minutes. I ask for the address and hang up. 45 minutes later, another hungry call received. Only this time, they were a little drunker and ruder. I fess up that I've been stringing them along, but they insisted that I was the Chinese takeaway and ordered me to take their order again. Unfortunately, at this point, the restaurant was now closed, so I guess they went to bed without their food. They never called back, so hopefully they learned a lesson. Am I the jerk for feeding rabbit stew to my friends? My friends and I, mid-30s, like to have themed dinner parties. For example, we've had Spanish potlucks, bought miracle fruit, the stuff that makes sour foods taste sweet, and tried a bunch of things to see what they tasted like with the sour made sweet. A friend did a Star Trek menu with plomeek soup, squash and beetroot soup, jambalaya and cellular peptide cake, peppermint cake. Another friend did a The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe menu with toast a la tumnus, fried fish and boiled potatoes and Turkish delight, stuff like that. I recently decided to host a Lord of the Rings meal and emailed the invitation and menu to my friends. Limbus, crispy flatbread with homemade jams and mustards, meat pies, vegetarian savory pies, potato and mushroom, rabbit stew, int drought, light spring vegetable soup, salad and foraged greens, berry tarts, beer, sweet cider and milk, served buffet style. I invited about a dozen adults and their kids, some friends of mine, some friends of friends or partners of friends, about 20 people total. Everything was going very well until one of the guests asked what the meat was in the rabbit stew. I thought she was joking at first, but she was completely serious. So I said, well, it's rabbit. I live in an area where we have an abundance of deer, rabbit, game birds, etc. So then hunting them is encouraged because otherwise they tend to starve in the winter for lack of sufficient food and or of disease due to overpopulation. I have a hunter friend who trades me meat from these animals for the jams and jellies I make. She freaked out and her daughter started crying and then told the other kids that they were eating bunnies. Apparently, they thought that by rabbit stew, I meant something like what I meant by limbus, that I was using a fantasy term for something more normal. And I guess I can sort of see it, because while they're different, cooked rabbit isn't that different than dark meat poultry in a stew. I apologized for the miscommunication and for upsetting her and her daughter but she was still livid and said that I was the jerk for serving rabbit under any circumstances. I again apologized for not being clearer that I really did indeed mean rabbits in the rabbit stew, but I wouldn't apologize for serving rabbit, especially as it was, in my opinion, more sustainably and humanely obtained than if I had bought a 12 pack of chicken thighs. She and a few other people think I'm the jerk. Obviously, mostly people with kids were upset by the cooked a bunny thing, though until it was framed to them that way, they seemed fine. Others think that I'm not exactly a jerk, but that I should have spelled out better in the invitation and menu that the rabbit stew was really rabbit, and or for not just apologizing for serving rabbit in the first place. So, am I the jerk for serving rabbit? What kind of idiots hear rabbit stew and assume that rabbit isn't in there? 
I wonder if they know chicken soup has chicken in it. Not the jerk, and this is coming from a rabbit owner. I recently had to explain to a C-level executive in my company that lamb was in fact made from baby sheep. He hasn't been able to eat lamb since, and I feel not a moment of guilt. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the guests? Please let us know. And this is part of why you don't invite too many people you don't know to your house. You're bound to get some idiots in there. Am I the jerk for refusing to sell my car and embarrassing my boyfriend in front of his dad? So, before I was with my boyfriend, I was with my ex. He was very wealthy, and despite the relationship not working out, he did give me a lot of gifts throughout it, and he bought me a car for our fourth anniversary and paid off in my name. We broke up right at the beginning of the lockdown, and I met my current boyfriend 10 months ago, and we've been official for 3 months now. I'm not one to speak about exes, and he never asked any questions, so I never told him how I got my car. He did compliment it, but that's about it. My boyfriend's father is a mechanic, and yesterday I was over at my boyfriend's apartment. His dad had to drop something off, and he commented about my car, saying it was the best in the parking lot, and he liked the color and rims, not knowing it's mine. We laughed about it, and his dad was asking me a ton of questions about it, and how much I pay a month, and I told him it's paid off and a gift. My boyfriend was surprised, and said he assumed I was paying it off, and asked by who, and I said my ex. He got quiet, and it was really awkward for a bit, where no one said anything. His dad broke the ice by saying it's a great gift since I don't have to worry about paying it off, and the conversation continued with him wanting to drive it around the parking lot and see inside, which I let him. When he left, my boyfriend started going off on me, saying he can't believe I never said anything and that I just embarrassed him in front of his dad. I said how, and he said he can't believe me and that I need to sell it since it doesn't fit my lifestyle anyway and that he thought it was a dumb decision I made, not that it was a romantic gift. I said that it's not romantic and that to my ex it meant nothing and he even got more mad. His dad came back and gave me my keys and left and then my boyfriend asked me to leave too, even though we had plans to go out. He's been distant since. Did I really embarrass him and am I the jerk? Not the jerk and in my opinion that's a red flag from your current boyfriend telling you that you need to sell it? Bruh. OP. He's saying I need to sell it because it's an embarrassing conversation to have if anyone asks me about it and how much I paid and that he doesn't feel comfortable driving it anymore, so it would be an inconvenience when we move in together to only take his car or drive separately. I told him he's overreacting and he's saying I'm being the jerk, not him, and that if I sell it I could downgrade to another paid off car that's cheaper and I could have money left over and I'm dumb and irrational. Your boyfriend is definitely being the irrational one here. Plus, it's no one's business how you paid for your car, and generally it's not a topic that would come up in conversation. I have a nicer car that I got because my dad passed. Not once has anyone who didn't know that ever asked me how much I paid for it. Your boyfriend is making up scenarios that aren't very common. When someone asks an intrusive question, just reply, why do you ask that? You know they're thinking, how could she afford that car or something along those lines. Even her so-called boyfriend just assumed she made a dumb decision and was making payments on a way too expensive car. Am I the jerk for ditching the date and leaving my partner stood up? I'm 27, female, an attorney, dating a 33-year-old male programmer. He's constantly late for things and has always had problems with keeping track of time. There have been times when we have made plans for a date and he would just go missing in action for hours only to respond after he was already late. Given how hectic my work schedule is, I try really hard to set time for him on the weekends and he is often, one, full on not responded when asked about plans, two, has left me waiting alone in restaurants for at least an hour each time. I know he has mental health issues and has struggled with going out to meet people so I try to be more patient and forgiving, but sometimes I do still end up blowing up at him when he's late. This time it was our anniversary. I found the place, booked way in advance and got there on time. I texted him asking, hey, are you on your way? And he left me on red. After waiting one hour, I basically texted him that I was incredibly upset that he's doing this again. I left and he eventually told me he got there 1.45 hours after we planned to meet. He then called me saying that he was really sorry, please come back and that he was really trying. I lost my temper and yelled at him that he didn't care about my time. He always leaves me waiting like a dog for hours when it suits him and that the least he could do was at least warn me when he was going to be late. He said that I didn't respect him for trying slash his mental health and how difficult it was for him to even meet me. He admitted that sometimes, once he's late, 
He even procrastinates more because he doesn't want to deal with the consequences of it. I admit that I am a stickler for time. Time is very important to me and now with work, it literally means I can't do other things because I just spend so much time waiting for him. I'm so upset because it just feels like irresponsibility. Am I the jerk for expecting him to be on time or at least tell me if he's going to be late? I'm a programmer. I have mental health issues. I don't enjoy being around strangers. I still have the respect required to tell my partner if I'm running late and to make sure that it is a very rare occurrence. Disrespecting you like that and then blaming it on mental health means that he needs to focus on improving his mental health. Until he does, I suggest maybe you shouldn't subject yourself to this. Don't set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. When someone constantly shows up late, it shows that you're not a priority to them. Don't date people like that. You'll only regret it. My wife is demanding to name our son Frodo. My wife and I are expecting our firstborn together. We haven't discussed names until we found out the gender. It's a boy. And when the family found out, we received many, many name suggestions and ideas from both families. Some were pretty cool and modern boy names. However, when I asked my wife when we were going to discuss the name of our son and talk about the cool ideas our family sent, she told me not to bother because she's already had a name in mind and felt strongly about it. I was upset, obviously, since she said she already decided, so that was selfish in my opinion. I asked what the name was and she told me Frodo. The name immediately rang a bell. My wife is a huge fan of Lord of the Rings and her favorite character is Frodo. She went on about how cool and unique the name is, but I really didn't think she was being serious. She said I should watch the movie and see how the name sounds and I'd love it. I said no way. She asked why not, the movie is popular and so is the name. To me, that's the problem. Don't get me wrong, but it's not a name we should go with. I mean, I already looked up the name and its meaning, but was mentioned that it will always be attached to that character from Lord of the Rings. To me, that was an instant no. My wife said I was being narrow-minded and called me controlling only because I told her this name is my hill to die on. Our son deserves a reasonable name and not to be attached to a character from a movie. I snapped and told her she could love the character all she wants, but choosing a name for our son is a serious matter and we both should get a say. She had a meltdown, gets mad, and claims I'm treating her as an incubator. She then went to tell my parents about how unreasonable I was being and they got mad only because we haven't considered the name suggestions they sent. So now I find myself arguing with my wife and my family. Her sister told me that my wife gets 80% say since she's the mother and I needed to stop stressing her out like that. My brother suggested I stop arguing with my wife about it and go behind her back and put the name I want on the birth certificate. But I wouldn't do that. That's not going to solve anything. The argument continues and I think I might be the jerk for still arguing about it knowing that my wife is stressed out. But I just don't think it's fair. Am I the jerk here? Am I overreacting? My best friend blames me for her husband's cheating. I'm a 31 year old woman and I've been best friends with my friend who is 34 since I was 15. She's been married to her husband for five years. I've never been his biggest fan. Something about him seemed off to me, but I never brought it up or told her my feelings on the matter as I had no reason to suspect he wasn't above board. Sometimes you just don't like people. It doesn't make them a bad person and I figured it was just that. Due to our connection through her, we do sometimes talk on social media. Not often, but he is on my friend list. Three nights ago, he made a pass at me, sending me some rather flirty messages and commenting about a picture I'd put up a few hours earlier of myself at the beach with a friend. I was naturally disgusted with this and asked him what he thought he was doing and told him that I was his wife's best friend. Then I asked if he was drunk. He quickly tried to backtrack and cover himself, but it was very clear he had been making a pass from what he had written. He then begged me not to tell her, at which point I ignored him. I then screenshot all the messages, saving them, and the next day, first thing in the morning, I called up my friend and asked her to come see me, where I laid it all out for her. I had wanted to tell her in person, as it would be easier to soften the blow, rather than immediately sending all the screenshots to her with no easing into it. I expected her to be upset, but I was surprised when she got upset with me. She told me I must have let him on in some way to make him think that kind of message was okay, that he'd never do something like this without being tempted first. I told her I'd never do that to anyone, last of all my best friend, and pointed out how clearly disgusted I was by what he'd written. I then told her I was worried because if he'd do this to her best friend, 
What was he doing with women who didn't know her? She left angry with me and hasn't spoken to me since we met up that day. I've sent her a few messages since then, but haven't gotten a reply. I hope it's just misplaced anger and she needs time to come to terms with this. I don't know what else I was supposed to do. Surely sitting on this and not telling her would have been worse. Not the jerk. You did the right thing. She's just in denial at the moment. Yep, absolutely, you did the right thing. Give her space and be supportive. People tend to lash out in cases like this, but it's a defense mechanism. It's upsetting, but not about you in this moment. Not the jerk. Yeah, it's really hard for most people to accept that the love you feel coming from somebody is connected to such a lie. She probably won't believe it until he breaks up with her if she's the kind who is desperate to be loved. Well, what would you have done in this situation? Would you have told your best friend or not? Please let us know. Absolutely. And if best friend can't appreciate the honesty, I'm not so sure I'd want to be friends with him anymore. Karen wants to use the shoulder lane to escape traffic. I dared her. This happened just a few hours ago. I was driving a semi on the highway when the traffic suddenly became bumper to bumper on a two lane due to an accident a couple miles ahead. Everybody was creeping and I was at the right lane. Suddenly, I saw a regular vehicle, not even an emergency vehicle, on the right side, the shoulder lane, passing me. There's not even an exit nearby. I was like, oh no. And as soon as I saw a couple vehicles behind me trying to do the same thing, I immediately blocked them by going slightly to the shoulder. So I'm occupying two lanes. I got a few honks, but I couldn't care less. If I'm suffering in traffic jams, everyone else should have to as well. Shoulder isn't for passing. As long as I didn't see any flashing lights behind me, I'm not opening that shoulder. We're crawling anyway. After a few hundred feet ahead, I see an idle police cruiser on the shoulder up ahead. Figured that nobody would dare using the shoulder anymore. I merged back to my lane. Turns out I was right. The shoulder became empty all of a sudden, but that's not the end. While I was chilling, still creeping, I heard a very annoying and repetitive honk on my left side. I looked and I saw this lady with huge sunglasses, a ponytail, bending down on her seat, looking at me, yelling something, looking outraged. I roll down the window and this is the following conversation. Karen, you know you're blocking two lanes, right? Me, confused. Huh? I was behind you on the right lane and you wouldn't move. I honked and you didn't care. Me, that's a shoulder. You're not supposed to drive on the shoulder. That's a lane. You are allowed to drive there. While she's still yelling incoherently, we are still slowly moving. Then I remembered there's an idle police cruiser on the shoulder that I saw a while back that we didn't pass yet. I'm sure everyone knows by now. Malicious compliance initiated. I reduced my speed even more so Karen is faster than me by a little bit on the left lane. Then I dare her by giving her the signal that she can pass me to use the shoulder. She aggressively took it cut in front of me and immediately went to the shoulder. However, what Karen didn't know was that the cruiser is already around the corner. I was driving a semi, so my field of vision is much higher and wider than everyone else. Karen was driving a sedan. Her field of vision is much lower and limited. What I didn't take into account was how aggressive Karen was driving. She cut the corner so quick without looking and ended up hitting the cruiser. Sorry, officer. It was so abrupt that I can hear the crash pretty loudly. I can also tell that the driver in front of me was gasping in shock as well. I've never seen an officer get out of the cruiser so fast before. This dude practically jumped out of the cruiser in less than one second. Then this is what I witnessed and heard when I'm creeping slowly with the traffic. Not wanting to miss anything, I roll down my passenger window. Officer, get out of the vehicle. Karen, still inside her car, full fluster mode. Officer, get out now. Karen finally gets out and literally word per word. But I wasn't at fault. You were stopped in a lane. Officer, this is a shoulder for emergencies, not for your convenience to escape traffic jams. Karen, but... Incoherent sob story as I drove away from the scene. I couldn't hear what was going on anymore, but I kept watching my front as well as the side mirror. Judging from her body movement, she was indeed panicking while pointing at my truck. Don't know why. Then, before the scene disappeared from my mirror, the last thing I saw was the officer pulling out his handcuffs and handcuffing her. Surprisingly, she complied without causing any more scenes. Then I continued to drive into the sunset. Edit. For those who asked for a video from the dash cam, I honestly would have wanted to relive this moment as well. However, my company is too cheap to invest in dash cams. They said that a tracker system is good enough. I've been using my own dash cam for the first few days until it doesn't stick to the windshield anymore. 
Due to non-permanent truck assignment, if there's a truck dash cam that doesn't require sticking to the windshield, I'm willing to get it. Edit 2. Some people did share with me that I shouldn't block the shoulder. While I did pay attention to flashing lights for emergency vehicles, back then it didn't occur to me that some emergency could come from vehicles without flashing lights. Thank you for teaching me a valuable lesson, and yes, I would prefer 99 Karens to pass me illegally than causing one innocent person to get hurt. You are not allowed to work from home. This was 2018-ish, before lockdown. I was working at a nuclear power plant in the mid-Atlantic. Once or twice a year, we would get a heavy snowstorm, but we were far enough south that the local government wouldn't plow or salt anything other than the main roads. The power plant has a policy during inclement weather that no matter how long it takes you to get to work, if you make it in, you get paid for the day. Otherwise, you have to take vacation. Note, I, like a majority of my coworkers, live in the closest large city which is an hour away. The drive to the power plant is half interstate, half hilly, curvy country road. I wake up and see we have about 10 inches of snow overnight and text my supervisor to ask if I can work from home. I have my laptop with me, don't have any work going on that I would need to be inside the power plant and I'd mostly be reviewing paperwork anyway. Supervisor tells me the policy for inclement weather and that he was at work already and the roads weren't that bad. I reiterate that I would just be sitting at my desk doing paperwork when I eventually get in. He is hearing none of this and tells me I'm not allowed to work from home. I need to drive the 50 plus miles to work or take vacation. I didn't even bother to respond and decided to take the vacation day. I head to a local store about half a mile away and pick up some snow sleds. I'd like to note that the roads were bad. I was driving a 4x4 and had some trouble getting to and from the store. The wife and I do some sledding in the neighborhood, have some hot chocolate, and other classic snow day activities. Around 11, I get a text from my supervisor. OP, are you able to come into work? Hardly anyone showed up because of this snow. There's some document we need reviewed, and we really need you here in case we need someone to do something in the power plant. I tell him, sorry, but I'm taking vacation today, per the policy. He tells me he's emailing me the document to review, and he can sign it for me if I approve. I replied, I'll take a look at it if I can, but my supervisor told me I wasn't allowed to work from home. He never responded to that and I never heard anything else about it, but I didn't have to work that day, which was nice. Bonus malicious compliance. I'm a salary employee, but have to record hours worked in a computer program. Our real HR policy says, if an employee works any part of the day, they will be paid for the whole day. I put 10 minutes of work time in for the time I was texting with him and didn't record any vacation hours. He approved my timesheet for 10 minutes of work and I saved a day of vacation. My boss has done the opposite. I let him know I was feeling sick and he texted me. Hey, I locked my account. Can you unlock it for me from home? I'm in IT. Yeah, it's unlocked. Going back to sleep now. Cool. You technically work today, so it doesn't count as a sick day. Get some rest. He's a great boss. Edit. Yes, he obviously did it on purpose, guys. Am I the jerk for packing my dad's lunch but not my brother-in-law's and refusing when demanded to? I'm 17, female. My parents have been remodeling the house. My dad tore a big chunk in the back and he and my brother, who's 19, male, and my sister's husband, who's 27, male, have been cleaning and picking the rubbish that was left. It's important to say that I do not like my brother-in-law at all. He's quite a jerk. He's disrespectful and has no boundaries. I know how badly this speaks of my family. But my brother and father are nothing like that, and they too believe that he's awfully wrong. I try to interact as least as I can with him, and I feel uncomfortable in his presence because until a few years ago, he used to make fun of me for anything I did. He's also used to having my sister or my mom do things for him, like cooking, serving him his food, doing his laundry, childcare, anything. That being said, my father and brother-in-law usually leave at the same hour to go to work. My dad works in construction and brother-in-law at a company. I've been doing my dad's lunch for two years now since I got a liking to cooking. I cook dinner for all of us and I only pack some for him. For example, during this instance I made enchiladas so I packed him a few with a side of lettuce, sour cream and green salsa in small containers, a bag of chips and a few chunks of sliced fruit, apple and pear. I also pack him a water and coke. When they came to the kitchen with my mom, I told my dad that his lunch was already in his car so he could eat something and leave without worrying and my brother-in-law said, What about me? I just shrugged my shoulders and said that I left him a container in the island and he was more than welcome to pack his own stuff 
and there were waters and cokes in the fridge. He gave me a dirty look and asked why I didn't do it for him, and I said, you're not my dad, so... My mom got in the middle and told me to start packing my brother-in-law's lunch, and he smirked when she said that. But I just sat with my plate and said, no, that he could pack his own lunch or buy something at his job. My mom said that I was embarrassing her, but my dad put it all to a stop when he told my brother-in-law to stop fighting and pack his own stuff because I already cooked for all of us. He ended up saying he would eat something at work and left early. My mom went off on me, but my dad shut her down and said that my brother-in-law is already an adult. She said, but she packs your lunch. And my dad said, yeah, but I don't demand it. When he left, my mom called me a jerk and said that she raised me better. Am I the jerk? ETA. I posted this and got distracted with homework. Thanks everyone for your kind comments about my dad. He truly is the best and I love him with all my heart. I'm really happy that you're saying awesome things about him. He hasn't read the post or comments, but my brother has. He's happy and thankful too. Not the jerk. Your brother-in-law is not your responsibility and he's a jerk. Nothing requires you to serve him. Your mom can pack his lunch if she wants it so badly. Not the jerk. And way to go dad for having your back. Next time mom says she raised you better, reply with, no, dad raised me better. He taught me self-respect. Am I the jerk for calling my fiance a jerk? I'm 28, female, and my fiance, 38, male, proposed to me last week. We've been dating for two years. He has a 15-year-old daughter from a previous marriage. Her mom passed five years ago, and I have a six-year-old son. When my fiance and I started to date, I noticed that his daughter had the master bedroom. I found it weird because I've never seen a kid take over the master bedroom before, but he brushed it off saying that the house was hers, so it was normal that she slept there with no further explanation. I thought he meant as an inheritance from when he passed, which still was weird because he was alive. But either way, I didn't say anything because we were only beginning and I knew it wasn't my business. Now that we are engaged, I said that I wanted to move here to live together for a while before we decided the wedding date. He said that we could do it or we could get our own house now because we will have to do it regardless. I asked what was wrong with this one and he said nothing but that it was his daughter's. To be honest, now I did get a little mad. I said it wasn't fair he called it his daughter's when we were about to get married and he was supposed to adopt my son, so now the house should be theirs and not only hers. I also said I wanted his daughter out of the master bedroom because it was ours. He got a little nervous and said that the house really belonged to his late wife and when she passed, the house became his daughter's. He has enough money for maybe 60% of a house, but that we will have to pay off the rest together. I was shocked and said that he could ask his daughter for the house because she's only 15 and he is her dad, but he said no, that it was his daughter's. I got angry and called him a jerk because he should have told me the truth before and he said that it's not like we will be homeless or anything. We still have three years and maybe four after that because his daughter will leave for college. He said he has always known he has to move out and that's why he saved. I asked what else belonged to his daughter that I didn't know and of course he said that his car, a 2020 Kia, the car that I always use will be hers when she leaves for college. I called him a jerk again and left with my son to my parents' house. When I told my family, my brother laughed because I talked and acted like a gold digger and called me a jerk. I felt betrayed and lied to. Am I really the jerk? I think I'm justified. ETA. He saw the post and asked for his ring back. I guess this isn't a problem anymore. ETA. No need to keep commenting. He'll come tomorrow to get his ring and his car. Things are over. You're the jerk. He told you the house belonged to his daughter. That you chose not to ask what he meant and assumed he really owned it is your fault. You deceived yourself. It's her inheritance from her mother and you want a share of it? The girl has already lost her mother, but that's not enough. Now you're demanding a share of her inheritance go to people the mother never even met. How can you think that's reasonable? Exactly. Everyone saying that he is the jerk for not telling her obviously didn't read the part where he did. She just assumed he meant something else. To be honest, I don't get the people saying he didn't tell her when he told her all along the house belongs to my daughter. Like, what did she think that meant? That dad bought the house and just gave it to her? Only the incredibly rich people do that. Anyone with common sense knows the house belongs to my daughter means it was my wife's. I can only stay in it till she comes of age and can decide. Honestly, I don't think most folks would know what to make of that statement and should ask for a clear explanation. 
Yes, OP's the jerk for assuming he owned the house, but moreover, she's the jerk for saying yes to a man before even knowing about his financial situation. And yes, he is also a jerk for not telling his potential wife exactly what's going on. You're the jerk. It sounds like his wife did the right thing to ensure that her daughter always has a home, considering you're now trying to push her out of it. Edit. My parents are split, and I'm the youngest. Both parents agreed that the house goes to me, and since the divorce, the house has been put under my name, not my dad's. Why? Because it ensured that I will have a home to live in if anything happens to them. And my father always said that if he ever dates or remarries, his future partner will not be pushing me out because I was here first. This is my home that I grew up in. Obviously, it will be mine and no one else's. Sounds like your fiancé's wife did the same thing, but since she's gone, she won't be able to make sure her kid will be okay. So she did the one thing that she could to make sure that her daughter will be okay, and she did a great job. Am I the jerk for telling everyone the truth why my brother didn't come to our family reunion? A little backstory for context. My brother's girlfriend and my wife got into an argument four years ago. My brother, Jack's girlfriend, Danielle, tends to hold grudges and cut people out of her life when she isn't happy with their actions. The fight my wife and Danielle got into was over a mutual friend, my brother's best friend, Henry. Daniela didn't like Henry and told my brother it was either her or Henry. My brother broke up with her, but eventually cut ties with his best friend and got back together with Danielle. Danielle told my wife to stop inviting Henry to cookouts, parties, and events. My wife said no. Henry is a family friend and is more than welcome to come to anything we host. Danielle said that she needed to rethink their friendship, feeling my wife didn't side with her. My wife basically told her to grow up and buzz off. My wife and Danielle haven't seen or spoken to each other since the argument. My wife did apologize numerous times, saying she was out of line. Danielle won't accept her apology, and by doing so, had my brother pick a side. It's been a real nightmare where my brother has tried numerous times to reconcile, try to meet his niece, who is two, and come to gatherings. Danielle gives him an ultimatum every time, so he chooses to stay away to avoid conflict with his girlfriend. For the past four years, every time we've had a family get-together, We've made excuses for Danielle and Jack, saying they're busy or had prior obligations. My parents said Danielle's biggest concern is family members will think of her differently if they find out that she's the one preventing my brother from attending family gatherings. She tends to put on an act for family that she's sweet and innocent. Behind the curtain, she controls my brother and has a very bad temper. We had a family reunion over the weekend, and once again, everyone asked where Danielle and Jack were. I finally told everyone the truth, that Danielle was still upset with my wife and she's been refusing to make amends and my brother isn't allowed to go anywhere without her. My parents said they've tried to talk to my brother alone, but Danielle won't let that happen. They asked how he liked being an uncle. I told them the truth, that he's never met his niece. He's made a couple of attempts, but Danielle wouldn't let him, so he hasn't been able to. The look on their faces were shocked, mortified, and confused. Some asked for me to go into detail, so I did, and others kind of just smiled and walked away. Now my parents are telling me I'm the jerk because family is going to look at Danielle differently, and I've made it awkward for any other family gatherings in the future for my brother and Danielle. Edit. For everyone asking what Henry did to Danielle, Henry told Jack that Danielle was trying to isolate him. She didn't like the fact that Henry told Jack to break up with her after six months of dating. Danielle didn't like how close Henry and Jack were. They would play golf together, and do things she didn't like, so she felt excluded. She gave my brother an ultimatum, saying Henry was threatening their relationship. Jack told Henry, so Henry spoke up and called her a jerk. Henry would try to point out other girls when they went to the bar to sway Jack's mind. As a girlfriend, she felt he was trying to break them up, which he was. Second edit. Thank you everyone for the great comments and opening my eyes to the type of relationship my brother is in. My wife has mentioned it in the past, and I didn't want to hear it since that's my baby brother. I've decided to sit with my parents and talk to them about everything. From there, I'm hoping to have a meeting with just my parents and my brother. I'm going to invite him over weekly and not give up on him. Hopefully, my persistence will pay off, and he will come hang out by himself. Not the jerk. I feel bad. It seems your brother's stuck in a bad relationship. Who cares about Danielle's feelings? Your parents should be trying to help your brother out of this cycle. OP. My parents are the most passive people ever. They said they tried to bring it up one time to my brother, and Danielle told them to back off or she will cut contact with them. My parents are so scared of losing him 
They will do anything to avoid confrontation. Am I the jerk for telling my son that I would not stop inviting his ex to family functions? My son, 44 male, divorced his wife, 43 female, after having an affair with a younger woman. I think she was around 23. He and his ex have two kids who are 12 and 6, and his ex almost has full custody of them. He gets them one weekend per month. He just got engaged to the woman he had an affair with and told me I'm not allowed to invite his ex to family functions anymore because his fiance is uncomfortable being around her. I told him no and now he's angry with me. My reasoning is she has custody of their kids the vast majority of the time and I want to be able to see my grandkids frequently and not only once a month. She has basically been my daughter for 20 years and it's not like their divorce is going to change the way I feel about her. And she is actually closer to most of the family than he is since she was always the one who kept us up to date about the kids, scheduled family outings with us, and even spent more time with us than he did. Also, her family lives in another country, and we've been her family for decades. I'm not going to take that away from her because my son decided to leave her. However, I recognize that I'm still really angry and hurt about my son's actions towards his ex-wife and kids, so maybe I'm acting out of anger. Am I the jerk for refusing to exclude his ex from our family functions? Edit. I was not expecting this many comments. I only want to add that my former daughter-in-law is not controlling or some sort of jerk who drove my son to cheat. She's a lovely human being who was also a very good wife to my son. He even admitted that she was completely not at fault, but that he unexpectedly fell in love when he met his new fiance. Nobody in this situation, including my son, thinks my former daughter-in-law did anything to cause my son to cheat. Not the jerk. His fiance should be uncomfortable. She deserves it. Choosing the fiancé cost him his marriage, custody of his kids, and maybe soon the relationship with his parents and the rest of the family. Wonder if he'll ever realize it's all his fault or not. Am I the jerk for not telling my boyfriend I'd been a surrogate before we were together? I, 28 female, have been dating my boyfriend, 29 male, for a little over two and a half years. When we began to get serious, I told him I didn't want to have kids and wasn't interested in that as it wouldn't be fair to string him along when things began to get serious. He wanted kids, but we talked it over and he decided he could live without having kids. Things were fine until we were visiting my family a few days ago for my dad's birthday. He saw some old pictures of me when I was 20 and clearly heavily pregnant. He was upset and asked me what this was and thought I'd had a kid and given them up. I explained to him that my older sister and her husband had been struggling with fertility, so I offered to carry their child for them and my 7-year-old niece was the result of this. I in no way feel maternal towards her. She is their biological kid and I've never felt I was anything but the handy oven for that bun. I never brought it up before as I didn't think it mattered and it was so long ago that it wasn't really anyone else's business. He however feels differently and when we left he told me I should have told him and said how it wasn't fair I'd been willing to give my sister a kid but wouldn't even consider having one with him. I got upset as there is a big difference between carrying a baby and raising a kid and I told him as much. I told him I was sorry for not telling him but I honestly hadn't felt it was his business as it had been years before we got together. I then reminded him how he had been the one to say that he could live without having kids as I had warned him long ago. He's still upset with me. I honestly didn't think I did anything wrong here. Am I the jerk? Edit. As people keep asking, I'm including this information in the post. Yes, it's preferred that you be over 21 and have had at least one kid to be a surrogate. However, in our country, doctors will judge on a case-by-case -case situation and will sometimes allow it so long as the surrogate is over 18, even if they've never had a kid before. We were one of those cases, though they tried to discourage it. My sister didn't want to use a stranger, however, as she was scared. In our country, the person who carries the kid has all the rights, and if they decided to keep the kid, my sister and her husband couldn't do anything about it. I was someone she trusted. Not the jerk. Also, your boyfriend clearly wants to have a kid. This is not going to go away. It's unlikely your marriage is going to last long term as his ability to father kids is going to last for quite some time and he's likely considering he can change your mind. My advice for you is to find someone who is not interested in having kids from the outset. Not the jerk. However, I think he's lying to himself about not wanting to have kids based on his reaction. You did something very loving for your sister and have no maternal feelings for their kid. I don't see why he was obligated to know that. Am I the jerk for telling my husband he can't leave me home with our two babies to go to his friend's wedding in Europe this summer? 
One of my husband's best friends is getting married in Europe this summer to someone we have not met. The engagement has been only a few months and we were given less than three months notice of the wedding. Because it's peak travel season, post lockdown travel craze, high gas prices, short notice, etc. Everything is so expensive and doing the trip as cheap as possible for a week for the both of us would cost upwards of $7,000. We cannot afford this. My husband thinks he has to go because it's one of his best friends and he was in our wedding four years ago. He thinks he's going to go alone with another friend while I stay home with our two kids who are three and one. Am I the jerk for saying no way? Here are some more nuanced details. About three years ago, he quit his job for a career change where he needed to go back to school for one year, cost $100,000, and now requires two plus years of training where he makes roughly $500 a month, aka nothing. He is two thirds of the way done with training. While I do agree it's our money, I am the breadwinner. My job provides basically all of the income being brought home, and I work a job I have no passion for because it's stable, supports our family, provides benefits, etc., while he works on his training and can be qualified to get a stable job sometime next year. We sold the house I bought before we were married and moved in with family, haven't gone on any trips, watch every dollar we spend, etc., to afford for him to pay for school and be able to do his training. I'm the default parent 99% of the time and keep our household running our kids fed, and bring them and pick them up from school, etc. I am a solo parent the majority of mornings and many evenings and weekends while he is completing his training. Our wedding was in the US and the friend maybe spent a total of $500 attending, flight, Airbnb, suit. He didn't get us a gift. The wedding was very small. My husband is one of three friends invited. The rest of the people there will be family. My husband says the reason I'm saying he can't go is because I'm jealous. Oh yeah, I am jealous. I haven't traveled in years, which I love doing. I sacrificed so much for him to follow his dream and he wants to pull a significant amount of money out of our dwindling savings to leave me alone with both kids for a week while he has fun with friends through Europe? This is messed up, right? Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. So you're the primary breadwinner and the primary caregiver? That's a lot of money just to go to a wedding. You're right to be upset, OP. Marriage is a two-way street. It's great that you're supporting him while he's training, but this is not the time for him to take an expensive trip and him and his friend should understand that. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. If Reddit boy tried to do me over like this, he'd need a new head. My husband is a member. When I got to work on Sunday, my manager told me that inventory was shut off because housekeeping needed to catch up from the weekend. We are crazy short-staffed. I was working alone, but Sundays are usually slow, so it was okay. All shift I had people walking in or calling trying to book a room and I had to tell them all that we had no rooms available. One lady called a few times and was not having it. First phone call, me. Thank you for calling our hotel. This is OP, how can I help you? Lady, hey, do you have availability for tonight? Me, unfortunately, we do not have any more rooms to sell tonight. Unbelievable. She hangs up. Second phone call, 45 minutes later. Me, intro. Lady, hi, my husband is a member. Can I make a reservation for tonight? Me, I'm really sorry, but due to staffing issues, we had to close our inventory for the night, so I have no rooms available. What do you mean? My husband is a member, and you can't make me a reservation? Me, no, I can't. She hangs up. Third call, 20 minutes later. Me, intro. Lady, hi, are you the manager? Me, I'm not, but I'm the only one here tonight, so what can I do for you? Lady, well, when I talked to you earlier, you said you had no rooms available due to no housekeepers, but I'm in front of your building right now, and I only see seven cars. How are you filled up for the night? My husband is a member. Me, so housekeeping worked all day today to clean enough rooms for the reservations we already had for today. So, unfortunately, I have no other clean rooms. Lady, this is ridiculous. You should have extra rooms available for your members. What is your manager's name? Here's the manager's name. She'll be here at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Lady, oh no, I'm calling corporate. Hangs up. I left out a lot of her ranting, but man, this lady was wild. I couldn't even make her a reservation if I wanted to. The computer literally wouldn't let me. And why do people think being a member means anything? 
All it takes to be a member is giving us your email and zip code. I'm just glad she called from her car and didn't come to talk to me at the front desk. Neighbor blocked our car in the driveway, so I got her car towed. My fiancé, 30 female, and I, 29 male, barely moved into this house a few months ago. The first week, we noticed a car parked right on our driveway, which obviously didn't belong there. When we went outside, the lady who lived next door asked if this was okay. Her house is right at the corner of the street and there's no driveway. She said the last owner was fine with letting her park there, so she hoped we wouldn't mind. Our driveway is big enough for two cars, so we said for now it was okay. After our son was born and I had to go back to work, we decided to buy a second car so it's easier for her to get around. All three cars don't fit, so we had to tell our neighbor she can't park there anymore. Ever since, it's become a whole issue. Once, she was parked behind me when I was leaving early in the morning, so I had to go banging on her door at 6 a.m. She had the audacity to be mad for me waking her up. I reminded her that she can't park there again, so we thought she got the message. Second time was when we were on our way home from the park. She was already parked there, so we would have had to park behind her. I went to go knock, and she said she was just putting her groceries away since we weren't home and the driveway is closer. This last time when it happened, my car wasn't working, so my brother came to pick me up early. My fiancé had to take our son to his four-month appointment, but the lady's darn car was parked right behind her, so there was no way for her to pull out of the driveway. She told me the neighbor wasn't answering the door. It got late, so she had to reschedule her appointment. I came home after and I called the cops to come deal with this because I was just so tired. Since they couldn't reach her, they did end up towing the car. When she found out, she was at my door, angry. She had been a few blocks down at her friend's house, which is why she didn't answer. But now she says she's stressed because she doesn't have the money to get her car back and it's our fault. Since both our cars were there, she assumed we were both home and if anything, we would have used my car to pull out of the driveway. My neighbor kept complaining how wrong we were to go to that extreme of making her lose her car when she absolutely needs it. We've just ignored her since then, but now every time we're stepping out, she glares right at us. I've had my car towed before too, so we know it's a nightmare of a fee to get it out of impound. That's why I'm asking if I'm the jerk. It's been almost a week since this happened with still no sign of her car parked on the street, so obviously she hasn't got it back yet. Not the jerk. You asked nicely, she ignored you. You pounded on her door on repeated occasions not so nicely and she ignored that you didn't want her parking there. The next logical step was to get the car towed because she wasn't getting the message. Bet she won't park there once she has her car back. Problem solved. Also, if the doctor charged you for a visit that you had to cancel last minute, I would send the bill to her too. Don't expect her to pay it, but at least to realize that she is costing you for being the jerk. In my opinion, you gave her too many chances. None of this was your fault. You were 100% clear with her from the beginning. Your neighbor has some seriously skewed way of rationalizing this. Don't let it rub off on you. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. If she needed her car, she shouldn't be parking it somewhere where she knew she no longer had permission to park it. Get a camera though, because retaliation is likely. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you get your neighbor's car towed if they kept parking in your driveway or not? Please let us know. I sure would. But first, I'd throw about a dozen eggs on it, especially if it's a really hot day. Mm, yes. Customer's milkshake isn't milky enough. Years ago, I used to work at a popular ice cream joint. The place was pretty chill, coworkers were fun to be around, and the pay was alright for a teenager. But, as with every other food service job, the customers made the experience a whole lot worse. Always had the regular annoyances, people yelling at you for long wait lines, orders being wrong, etc., even had a guy get up on the counter and go off on me because we were out of bananas for banana splits. But one experience really stood out from the others. We had a regular customer who would come in, no kidding, every day to get a strawberry shake. He was fine with long waits or if our card machines were down. But this dude would summon the might of the devil if his milkshake wasn't made with enough milk in it. Worse, he would sit there and wait until you remade it to his liking. Stupid store policy made us remake any order for free if the customer wasn't happy with it. One day this dude comes in and orders, guess what, a strawberry milkshake. I was working the ice cream bar, so filled with defeat, I started making his order. Company recipe was three scoops of ice cream for a regular smoothie. Since I knew this guy liked his milky, I only put two. I handed it to him and went about the next orders, until five minutes later he comes back 
and screams at me that the milkshake wasn't milky enough. Now, every time in the past, I always made his this way. Two scoops to give it that milky consistency. This time, I guess he wanted to just mess with me. At this point, I'd had enough. The day had been rough as it is, so I really didn't want to handle this, especially since I could tell by the grin on his face that he was trying to make my day worse. This is where the malicious compliance comes in. I decided to make the milkiest milkshake possible, but while still being a milkshake by technicality. I went back to my station and started the concoction. I didn't put two scoops, I didn't put one scoop. I put one tablespoon of strawberry ice cream and filled it up to the brim with milk. After the pointless blending, I handed him the milkshake he didn't want, but the one he deserved. I watched him with my own grin on my face beaming back at him while he tried his milkshake. He took a sip and immediately started going off on me that it was just milk. I told him, no sir, I put strawberry ice cream in there just as you asked. I could see the rage in his eyes as he demanded his order be remade. I then politely informed him, our store policy only lets you have your order remade once for free. His face burned bright red as he muttered something under his breath, then stormed out the door, slamming it behind him. Every time after that, he never asked for me to remake his order. A few months later, I got a better job where I didn't have to deal with angry customers. I used to work at an ice cream store as well. We had a guy who asked for a blueberry shake with extra blueberries. When he got his shake, he complained that there weren't enough blueberries in it. Fine, we made him another one with even more blueberries, but still not an unreasonable amount. He then complained that there were too many blueberries and that they kept clogging up his straw. The manager gave him a soda spoon and told him to leave. I really want some ice cream now. Am I the jerk for wanting my stepdaughter to switch schools her junior year to live with us? My husband and I have been married for two years and have five kids. His daughter from a previous marriage, who's 16, my two sons from a previous relationship, 13 and 15, and two kids together who are three and one. My husband's daughter lived primarily with her mother until she was in eighth grade, when she was offered a scholarship to go to a very good boarding school for high school. I've never agreed with the idea of sending teenagers to live away from family, but her mother and my then fiance agreed that it would be beneficial for her. They drafted a new custody agreement to reflect the new school schedule. My husband moved out of state, so he always had summers and holidays anyway. When I married my husband, I thought that she would be just a day boarder, which seems better than full time, so I let it go. By the time I learned the truth, 2020 was in full swing and removing her wouldn't have been safe even if she wanted to leave, which she didn't. Fast forward to 2022. She's 16 years old and a junior. I recently learned that her mother moved back to her home country six months ago and has been letting my stepdaughter manage her own money. This means that there's now not even a parent in the same state or even the side of the country for my stepdaughter. She is completely independent in her day-to-day -day life. My stepdaughter has every weekend unsupervised to do whatever she pleases and independent access to not only multiple major cities, but is only a day trip from another country that she has dual citizenship in. I've seen Facebook posts of her going to art shows in other states without even pretending to ask one of her parents for permission. This isn't acceptable. It's not okay for a teen to just go live her own life, especially to this degree. We have two sons that are only one and three years behind her and they're starting to see the double standard as well. I would never let any of my kids do the things my stepdaughter is doing. She's my kid too and this needs to stop. She needs to change schools to be either with her mother or with us and be part of a family. My husband says that it's different because she was raised differently and is just more responsible, but that's BS. If he actually thinks she's not being a normal 16 year old with that level of freedom, he's lying to himself. My stepdaughter loves her school, of course, and is very resistant to changing schools for all of one year of high school to leave her friends and no doubt doesn't want to actually have rules. I'm still pushing the issue, and now my husband and stepdaughter are mad at me for trying to change the status quo. The boys are mad at me for having double standards, and other family members are mad at me for either over or understepping in my role. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. She's at a boarding school and doesn't need to ask permission to see art shows. You're being dramatic, and she's not even your kid. On top of that, you're controlling. You're acting as if she's getting into trouble and interacting with bad people her age or older. Calm down, you have no good reason for her to change schools and you are overstepping your role. Her parents already created a plan and you have to respect that. 
She's asking the school for day-to-day -day things she would need parental permission for, and unless OP is a time traveler, the telephone and email exists. Stepdaughter could very well be asking mom over the phone or via text to be getting permission to travel out of state. The only point OP might have is to suggest that dad's, assuming he wants that, permission be necessary to travel out of state, etc. Most teenagers have spending money that they can act with on their own. Daughter likely has a roommate and an RA equivalent on the floor, house mother, etc., which are possibly stricter than most parents. I'm sure his kid would tell him before she goes out of state, so it's not like she's completely running rogue. OP is just mad she has no control over a situation that doesn't concern her. You're the jerk. She hasn't given you any reason to doubt her ability to take care of herself and behave appropriately, so you would be punishing her for literally nothing. She's going to art shows? How wild. Just leave the kid alone. She's not your kid and she's been fine this long. Removing her from a situation that works for her and isn't harming anyone would be cruel and unreasonable. You should be proud she's independent and cultured. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk or is she in the right? Please let us know. I heard chill pills are on sale right now, just FYI. Am I the jerk for showing my husband proof that his mom offered to bring him a steak dish to the hospital? My husband was in an accident last week. He was staying at the hospital for his broken leg. Only me and his mom were there. His mom and I don't get along at all. He tells me I'm overreacting or paranoid whenever I point out how she's mistreating me. He complained about hospital food, saying it had no taste, and asked me to make his favorite meal, which is a steak dish, and bring it to him at the hospital. Noting that steak isn't cheap where we live, and I didn't have enough time to prepare it, I told him I will see what I can do. Then his mom said if I'm truly a supportive wife, then I'd make it happen. Once we went outside his room, his mom's tone changed. She suddenly seemed nice and said that she could see how exhausted I was and so I should go home and not worry about the steak dish because she said she'd make it for him. I asked if she was 100% sure and she said, absolutely. The next visit I showed up and my husband asked why I didn't bring the steak dish he asked for. I saw his mom there. I told him his mom offered to make it for him instead and told me not to worry about it. He didn't believe me and was like, mom said that? I'm not buying it. Mom, you really said that? Her reaction shocked me. She acted confused and said that I'm his wife and she didn't know why I'd expect her to perform my duties for me. I was confused and didn't know what to do. My husband seemed upset the entire visit and I waited till his mom left to talk. I swore to him his mom said she'd take care of it but he said he didn't believe me. I pulled my phone out, called his mom, and put her on speaker so he could hear the conversation. I said, didn't you say you'd make the steak dish and that I didn't have to worry about it? She replied, I did, but I obviously wasn't actually going to do it. I was just trying to help my son see how his wife is during the rough times and you took the bait. My husband raised his eyebrow. He got upset. He called her later and picked a fight, then said no more visiting. She lost it, called me petty and manipulative and blasted me on Facebook, saying I stopped her from seeing her son only because I couldn't get her to do things for me, like cooking for my own husband. Now his family is criticizing me for this. Not the jerk, but your husband and his mother both are. Who demands that people bring them steak dinners in the hospital? He didn't like the hospital food? What a baby. Bad apples don't fall far from the bad tree. I don't see him demanding anything here. He asked, she said she'd see what she can do. He followed up on it later. And if you've ever had hospital food, or if your coping mechanisms revolve around food at all, you'd know why he was asking for a decent meal in a stressful time. He's not the jerk, and OP is not the jerk. His mother is completely the jerk here. He is the jerk for never believing his wife when it comes to how his mother treats her. And it sounds like he got undeniable proof that OP was right all along, doesn't it? At which point he immediately changed his tune which is 100% the appropriate reaction. The appropriate reaction would be to trust your spouse in the first place without them having to trick the other party into admitting the truth. OP literally says, but he didn't believe me. You don't get kudos for finally believing her when the proof is irrefutable. Edit. I'm not replying to this any further because people apparently can't fathom their mom lying to them. I never said spouses don't lie, but if you are in a marriage where you don't believe your spouse on something like this, I'm sorry. Not the jerk. She called you manipulative? To be honest, he doesn't sound ideal. I'm sure he can cope with hospital food for a few days. Also, bring a steak dish? It will be cold and a mess to eat, 
Just bring him pizza or something. If you don't have kids already, I'd suggest you move as far as you can. She will make your life horrible. You're clearly, in her eyes, a bad wife. Next, you'll be a bad mother. Am I the jerk? I didn't disclose the details of my inheritance to my wife. My wife has been a stay-at-home wife since the beginning of our marriage. She got an inheritance from her grandfather a few years ago. It was about 5 million Indian rupees, about 65,000 US dollars. I was super excited when I came to know about it, thinking we'd be able to finally repay our previous landlord. However, she refused, saying that it's her money gifted to her by her grandfather. She also said that it was the only money she could claim as just hers, so she wanted to keep it. I was super hurt because I've never once told her that my earnings were mine only. I always treated it like our money. I then told her that if she didn't share her inheritance, any future inheritances of mine wouldn't be shared among us either. She agreed. She then went on to buy herself a car. Fast forward to now, almost four years later. My parents left me their entire assets which comes to about 40 million Indian rupees, about 522,000 US dollars. I told my wife I got an inheritance and she seemed quite unbothered by it. She said that I can do whatever I want with it. First, I paid off my student loans and bought myself a nice laptop. Then I invested the rest of it. My wife asked me where I got the money to pay off my student loans and buy myself a laptop. I reminded her about my inheritance. She was surprised that my inheritance was so much and started saying that I was selfish for not having told her the exact amount. I reminded her of our agreement and said that it shouldn't matter how much inheritance I got since each of us was free to do whatever we wanted with our own inheritances. I also told her that if she had asked me, I would have told her. She started crying and said that I kept such a big information away from her. She's locked herself in the room and is refusing to speak to me. Am I the jerk? Edit. Also, point to be noted is that 30 million out of the 40 million was used to repay my student loans. I spent close to about two locks on my laptop. I invested eight locks. I studied abroad, so my student loans were a lot. Your wife, I don't think we should share inheritances. You, don't share your inheritance. Your wife, why didn't you share? Not the jerk, she made her own bed. You both probably need to get better about viewing this marriage as a partnership, but in this specific situation, she's in the wrong. Everyone sucks here. Fair is fair, but you two are going to have a terrible life together if you carry on this way. Not the jerk. I don't think of inheritances as a marriage property. Your wife is being a hypocrite because she agreed that your inheritance is yours. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Yowza, I'm getting stressed out just thinking about dealing with her. Am I the jerk for feeding my sister non-vegan food while babysitting? My dad has a four-year-old daughter with his current wife, my stepmom. My stepmom is vegan and extremely health conscious after surviving cancer and only allows my sister food that's vegan and organic. She believes that anything else is bad for you. I try to be understanding of this, although I myself am not a vegan or vegetarian. She asked me last minute to babysit my sister last week and dropped her off at my apartment at around 9 a.m. that morning. She initially told me that she'd only be gone for two to three hours, but didn't pick her up until almost 2 p.m. due to an appointment running late. My stepmom packed a bag that contained only apple slices, a zip bag of cauliflower crackers, and some organic juice. By noon, I was hungry and didn't want to make myself food without feeding her, and she had already eaten her snacks. My healthy food options were limited, so I made some veggie pizzas for us and gave her juice and fruit snacks as well. After my stepmom came to pick her up, I told her what we had for lunch, and she was upset that I gave her daughter non-vegan cheese and fruit snacks, but referred to everything as unhealthy. She thought I should have either waited until she came to pick her up or given her some of my raw veggies that we put on the pizza to tide her appetite over until she was picked up. My dad has since informed me that my stepmom doesn't want me to babysit again until I can learn to respect her wishes regarding her parenting. I can see how I may be the jerk given that I knew it wasn't vegan, but then I also tried my best and didn't just plop a steak in front of her. Opinions? Am I the jerk? Edit. I did not call or text beforehand because my stepmom informed me that her phone would be on silent while she was at her appointments. I also did not have a booster seat to drive to the store, and food delivery services are expensive where I live, which I don't really have the extra money for at this moment. Broke college student things. Anyway, I was told to add this information to the post, so I hope it provides for clarity. Not the jerk. Were you supposed to just skip feeding her daughter lunch because she failed to provide you with food? 
Your dad has informed you that stepmom doesn't want you to babysit until you can learn to respect her wishes? First of all, you did this last minute as a favor, so it sounds to me like she's the one who needs you to be willing to babysit, not the other way around. Secondly, you don't need to learn to respect her wishes. She needs to provide you with food so you can respect her wishes. I'm guessing her anger at you is going to last right up until she needs a last minute babysitter again, and then she'll remember to pack enough food. Stepmom may be livid with OP now, but she'll be there when she needs you. You did the best you could under the circumstances. Am I the jerk for demanding to be a partner in my wife's business? During lockdown, my wife took up crafting and has become quite good at it. She makes beautiful creations. We've talked in general terms about setting up a business or renting a table at a craft show to sell her goods, but didn't take any concrete action until recently. One day, my wife was commenting how she wished she could do her crafts as a full-time job. I decided to surprise her and registered her preferred domain name and over the course of a couple weeks, secretly built her an online store. I showed her the store and things got real very quickly. We built a business plan, spent several thousand dollars of joint funds and startup costs and have been actively pursuing sales, with some early success and positive feedback. It is the early days and we are not yet profitable. I am involved in all aspects of the business, procurement, sales, marketing, fulfillment, except design and production. I have also happily taken on more of the housework so she has time to create products. Over the last few days, my wife has gotten very territorial and cringes when I talk about our business. At times, she actively tries to correct me and insists it is her business. She sees my role somewhere between an employee and what is expected of a supportive husband. I get it, this business is her dream that I was helping her realize. I don't want to overstep, and I have reassured her that she is CEO and gets final say over all aspects of the business, but I am still a co-founder and owner. I feel like the recognition that this is a joint business is important given the amount of time and energy we're both investing into it. It is a journey we are doing together. Life partners and business partners. Her dream has become my dream. Here's where I may be the jerk. My wife continues to be protective, and I told my wife that unless she accepts me as a partner, let's say 49%, I will find other ways to support her, but won't be working on the business. There is too much work for one person to do, and I'm afraid of sabotaging the business by ceasing work. She's given me lame answers that she appreciates my support, but won't say the magic words that she considers me a business partner. Am I overstepping, and am I the jerk? Summary. I help my wife start a business. I may be the jerk for refusing to work on the business because my wife refuses to recognize me as a business partner. Everyone sucks here. You are assuming ownership of an entity you are not invited to own. Your partner is exploiting the labor of a third party, you, without fair compensation. You are entitled to an ownership stake considering the effort you have put in, but you grossly overstepped assuming it. Your wife's casual dismissal of the value of your contribution is ungrateful, naive, and exploitive. You both should have hashed this out first. That's the vibe I'm getting. Maybe the wife would have been perfectly fine doing all of this from the jump by herself, but OP sort of made himself a co-owner without her expressed consent or knowledge when he did all that initial stuff by himself. Granted, she benefited a lot, but it wouldn't be surprising if she felt some ways about her expressing she wanted to do this business herself, and then suddenly he's inserted himself into every aspect of it, starting it without her and is now demanding half ownership of what she probably wanted to be her own business venture. I agree everyone sucks here. She's benefited greatly from his contributions, but I don't blame her for feeling some resentment towards him for how he went about a lot of this. I'd personally feel some kind of way if I told my spouse I wanted to start my own company and they took it upon themselves to start it without me. I'm sure she appreciated the effort and thought, but I'd be upset if I didn't get to be a primary part of the initial startup for my dream business idea. That's the part that sticks out to me. He took something she wanted to do for herself, did it without her in secret, and then co-opted her dream as now being their dream once he realized he could make a buck off of it. This doesn't feel like helping, it feels like he railroaded so that he could put her in exactly this position. She either accepts his terms or he quits on her and ruins the business he started for her behind her back. You're the jerk. You used a surprise to shoehorn yourself into her project, not okay. Your surprise was in no way a gift if it actually meant that you were going to claim half ownership and you never should have presented finished things to her as a means to demand ownership of a business that she wanted to start. Ownership and respective job roles should have been discussed in advance of any work, 
and you circumvented that and demanded partnership based on work she did not ask you for. You are being a sketchy and manipulative business partner here. You're the jerk. You turned doing a nice thing for your wife into a hostile takeover. And then when you don't get your own way, you try to pull the rug out from under her. You're the jerk because you took on a bunch of tasks for her without talking to her ahead of time and set all these expectations and then demanded that she meet your expectations that you didn't discuss with her first. Seriously, dude, don't mix personal relationships with business. I'll be the one to say it. If the roles were reversed, most of you would be supporting her. You started the business, girl. You deserve more than half. Don't let him take advantage of you like that. This is one of those posts where you all just hate the dude because this is Reddit. Edit, I'm a girl, but I've spent enough time on Reddit to know how y'all think. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for telling my boyfriend's colleagues that I won't cook for them anymore? I, female, live with my boyfriend in a condo we rent together in Toronto. I'm Indian and I moved here about three years ago and he's Canadian. I love cooking and I'm vegetarian since birth. He became a vegetarian because of his ex and he didn't want to switch after breaking up with her. Thank goodness for me because I don't know how to cook meat. I only know how to make Indian food but I learned quite a bit of new recipes during lockdown and I experiment with this because we both work from home. Recently, he started going to the office and I made lunch for him daily. After a week or so, he told me not to wake up early to make lunch just for him, but I told him I didn't mind that. He then mentioned the reason, stating it was because his colleagues and friends eat his lunch anyway, because it's homemade and he eats whatever takeout or food they get. So I told him that I can pack an extra portion which they can share and that was working well for a few weeks. Last weekend, he decided to invite his said friends over because we haven't officially met. When they came over, they appreciated the homemade food and it's something they look forward to, but one person pointed out that I don't pack enough protein and I should pack food that has a balanced diet. I sorta of don't remember what he said after that because I was internally crying. When my boyfriend saw my reaction change, he told him that he never seems to care about protein when he's gulping down all the beer and that's when the group sorta of divided into two. I then told them that I will stop cooking for all of them and one of those guys pointed out that I was the jerk for punishing the entire group because of one person's comment. P.S. I know this is childish, but I kind of took it personally because I love cooking so much. So much that my boyfriend does all the cleaning and dishes when I take care of cooking. I don't know if my reaction was a cultural thing and if this is taken as a joke here. Edit 1. Thank you so much, you guys are really sweet. Many commented to ask why my boyfriend gave his food away. He told me during lunch when he gets his food out, everybody would say something about the smell and would want to try a bite. Because it's about 5 people, he gives away 60% of his food. So I decided to make extra portion, though it's not sufficient for all 5. My boyfriend would at least eat his tummy full. Honestly, I taught him to share food and I think it's my fault to begin with. Edit 2. Because most of my time in Canada has been during lockdown, I don't have a lot of friends. Please feel free to DM me if you live near Toronto and I promise you a good meal with plenty of protein. Not the jerk. You've been overly kind and generous. If you don't want to cook for any reason, then don't. They can bring their own lunches to work. OP. That's the problem. They seldom bring lunch and only order food. That's not healthy compared to homemade food. But it's not your problem. You're not obligated to feed these moochers. Your boyfriend needs to stop letting people eat his food and they need to figure out their own lunch. Not the jerk. My Karen sister expects me to pay her mortgage. My sister bought a house with her boyfriend last year. They got a mortgage and when they broke up, he managed to wiggle his way out and leave her to keep paying the mortgage alone. She's making the payments, but barely, and she's had money issues that means she's at the point where she can't even afford dinner some nights. Obviously, we're, me, mom, dad, and siblings, worried about her and we want to help her out. My current lease runs out at the end of the month and half her mortgage is way less than the average rent in the area. So we talked and I agreed that I, along with my three kids, would move in with her for a while. I would pay rent, which would cover half of her monthly mortgage payment and utilities, and we'd buy our own food, but we'd still share. This way, she'd get her mortgage paid off, my kids and I get to live in a nice house at below average rate, and we know that my sister is doing okay financially and mentally. However, with less than a month before the move, we talked today to just get up to speed on how everything is going on her end, and she asked to rearrange a few things so that we can move in. 
She said, Your half is all sorted. I asked what she meant. There are two bedrooms and a bathroom on each floor, so she was thinking that we could have the upstairs and she could have the downstairs. I asked what happens with the kitchen and she explained that she'll have exclusive use of the kitchen and when I bring my stuff over we could set up a kitchenette, a microwave, a kettle and a mini fridge on the top floor. I asked where my kids were meant to sleep and she said that my daughter could sleep in my room and my sons could bunk together. My understanding before this was that I get my own room as does my daughter and there are no limits on floors or bathrooms or the kitchen. As my sister has said, that as there were four bedrooms, there was enough room for everyone, and mentioned rearranging the rooms, so I assumed that she meant she was taking the fact I'm bringing three kids into consideration. She said as I'm paying for half of everything, I get half the house. I said that my kids and I can't share two bedrooms and a microwave, and she said I was being dramatic and will be fine. However, I said that this isn't going to work for us, and if she wants us to move in, we're going to need her to condense her office and bedroom into one room, so my daughter can have the free room, plus use of the kitchen. My sister said that as we would be using the majority of the house, I should pay at least 75% of the mortgage, possibly 100%, as there's four of us and one of her. I then said that this really is not going to work out for us, so I will look for a new place with my kids and she can figure her money out herself. She then called me a jerk as she could lose the house without my help and said I was holding money over her head and said I was entitled to think that I would get more than half the house when I'm only paying 50% of the mortgage. I said she's the one setting restrictions and if I had known I was only paying for the top floor then I wouldn't even have agreed to move in. Am I the jerk? Info. My sons are 11 and 13. My daughter is 5. My sister said if I paid 75% of the mortgage, I could either have a third room or kitchen access, and 100% gets me three rooms and kitchen access, which is the point that I said this would not work out. Support our channel by joining as a member today, and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.